will have a child. Will you give birth? The doctor's voice did not bode well. Miss, can you hear me? Yes, of course, Brittany replied softly, struggling to get up from the chair. Her legs were weak, her hands trembled slightly, and her mind struggled to grasp what was happening. When you decide whether to go through with the pregnancy or not, come for an appointment. The doctor addressed the patient again and turned off the monitor screen. Just don't delay your decision. It may be too late. But I would not recommend an abortion with your RH factor. It's highly undesirable. In the future, you're unlikely to have children if you choose that path. It seemed like Brittany didn't hear the doctor's voice. She left the doctor's office without saying goodbye and slowly walked down the hospital corridor. She encountered pregnant women along the way. Their faces reflected happiness and contentment. Perhaps they couldn't wait to hold their little ones, to hear their first cries, to embrace their long-awaited angels. Did Brittany think the same way? Not at the moment, right now. She had a hard time comprehending what had happened to her. She expected anything but this. Although she should have known, after all, she was already an adult and knew where babies came from. What should I do now? Brittany wondered as she sat on a bench outside the hospital. At this moment, my baby is still tiny. No one will be able to guess that I'm pregnant. But in a maximum of four months, I won't be able to hide it anymore. What have I done? Why did I agree to my brother's persuasion and sacrifice myself? What a fool I am. Brittany sat and recollected the events of the past months. In June, after finishing her exams, she returned to her hometown. After high school, she decided to enroll in a pedagogical institute. She had always dreamed of working with children and becoming a primary school teacher. She happily left home after high school and got into the university. Finally, she could breathe easily and stop living under her father's constant instructions. She didn't know why, but her father was always critical of her. He always found something to blame his daughter for. Sometimes, Brittany felt like her dad hated her. She couldn't remember him ever carrying her on his shoulders or being affectionate with her. He didn't treat her mother with much tenderness either. Her mom explained her father's behavior by saying that it was just his character and that her parents had treated each other the same way. So this kind of interaction with loved ones was normal for him. Even in her childhood, Brittany noticed that her father treated her brother very differently. He spoke calmly to him, never scolded him, and even admired him without any reason. Kevin, Brittany's brother, was seven years older than her. He had long finished school but didn't bother going to college. He started working in an auto repair shop, often didn't spend nights at home, hung out with his friends, and even drank. But their father turned a blind eye to all of it, considering that such a lifestyle was perfectly acceptable for a young man. Let him enjoy his freedom while he's young, he would say to his wife. When he gets married, there won't be time for parties. What are you saying, Doug? Kate, Kevin's mother, tried to reason with her husband. Our son's lifestyle won't lead to anything good. Be quiet. Doug interrupted his wife and pounded his fist on the table to silence Kate. Kevin's a real man. He's been working and earning money since he turned 18. Their family lived in an old five-story panel building, and their three-room apartment on the second floor was small and cramped. Brittany and Kevin had their own rooms, while their parents had to share the living room. Doug worked as a mechanic at the local factory, and Kate had spent her entire life working at a sewing factory. Their salaries were modest, and they struggled to make ends meet to raise their two children. When Kevin started working, things did get a bit easier. However, lately, his earnings no longer made it home. Where was he spending his money? His parents had no clue. Kate had tried several times to find out how he was using his money, but Kevin's responses were vague, and he made it clear that his mother didn't need to know. Kevin felt the support and impunity that came from his father. Perhaps that's why he acted so rudely with his mother. Brittany watched all of this unfold and couldn't figure out how to protect her mother. She loved her brother, and she loved her parents too. They were her family, her only close relatives. 
Brittany also had her grandmother, Rachel, who lived a few kilometers from their home. Brittany often visited her grandmother, and the journey took about 13 minutes. The beginning of July didn't foreshadow any disruptions. Brittany was enjoying her summer vacation. She had turned 18 at the end of April, and it seemed like a time to live and enjoy life. Finally, she could go to discos with her friends. Her friends had been going to the local club for a while, and they invited Brittany to join them. But her father strictly forbade her from going to such places. To be honest, a girl raised with such strict rules didn't really want to spend time at discos. Brittany didn't know how to feel about her father, whether to love him, fear him, or hate him. She tried to stay out of his way as much as possible, often running to her grandmother's, who always welcomed her with open arms. How's everything going at home? Rachel asked her granddaughter, brewing aromatic herbal tea in a teapot. Brittany had just run to her grandmother's place to spend some quiet time and not be on edge about every little noise at home. Her father was delayed at work, and she had only managed to wait for her mother to inform her where she was going and not cause her any unnecessary worry. Dad is always dissatisfied with something. Mom stays silent, not daring to contradict him. Kevin lives his own life, feeling completely free and above the law. Grandma, why doesn't my dad love me? Brittany asked. I've told you more than once, Brittany. Doug is just not easy to understand. He was born this way, and there's nothing we can do about it. He loves you in his own way, as he knows how, Rachel explained with love, looking at her granddaughter. He has a strange way of showing love. The girl sighed. I think I'll take your offer, Grandma, and stay with you for the whole summer. I can't stand being in the same apartment as my dad. I've grown used to being away during the school year. I don't mind, but you'll only make him angrier if you do that. Live with me, but don't forget about your parents. Have some compassion for your mother. She was so eagerly awaiting your arrival for the summer break. She missed you. She couldn't believe that you're no longer in school, but a college student, the elderly woman advised. By the way, how is she doing health-wise? Is she complaining? At least not in front of me. Although I did notice her taking some pulls a few times. And her heart medication is on the kitchen shelf in the most prominent spot, Brittany said. We should try to persuade her to get a check up, Rachel said with concern. We shouldn't take heart issues lightly. But Kate keeps postponing it, and I don't know what she's hoping for. Don't worry, Grandma, I'll talk to her about it, reassured the granddaughter. Let me tell you about what I've learned and experienced during the school year. You can't imagine how much I enjoy being in school. In the gazebo beside the old wooden house, a lamp burned late into the night. Rachel and Brittany sat, sharing different stories with each other. The grandmother was happy to have her granddaughter nearby and tried to envelop the girl with love and care. Kevin was nothing like his sister. They seemed as if they weren't related. Brittany couldn't answer why her father treated his son with such tenderness while being rough and disrespectful to his daughter. Her mother and grandmother couldn't explain it either. On this quiet summer night beneath the lamp with a lampshade, Brittany felt cozy and at ease. She could feel her eyelids getting heavy probably due in part to the chamomile tea with fragrant honey. Rachel tacked her granddaughter into bed, and Brittany crawled under the warm blanket, enjoying the scent of clean sheets. That night, Brittany had bright and pleasant dreams. It was already nearing noon when she opened her eyes and stretched in her bed. Good morning, dear, her beloved grandmother's voice made the girl smile. You slept so soundly that I didn't want to wake you, since you're up now. I'm waiting for you in the gazebo. I've just baked some delicious muffins. Brittany didn't keep her grandmother waiting for long. After washing up and getting ready, she headed to the gazebo and planted a kiss on the old woman's cheek. Granny, I love you so much. I'm so glad to have you, she said, gazing into the kind eyes of the woman. What shall we do after we? I saw strawberries in the garden yesterday. It's time to pick them and make jam. You've got sharp eyes, Rachel praised the girl. Let's do just that. Her grandmother's house was small, with two bedrooms, a living room, an entryway, 
and a spacious kitchen. Brittany especially loved the veranda, where it was wonderful to sleep in during the summer. About 80 meters from the house, there was a railroad track. Brittany had grown accustomed to falling asleep to the sound of passing trains since childhood. She often imagined herself traveling by train with her mom, dad, grandmother, and brother to a distant blue sea. How she longed for the sea back then, but her family couldn't afford such a trip. So, going to the seaside remained a dream for Brittany. Only in her senior year of high school could she fulfill her long-cherished wish. A few students from her school were selected to attend a summer camp on the coast as a reward for their academic achievements. Brittany was among them. She still remembered how her mother prepared her for the trip, sewing so much clothing that the girl's eyes widened. She spent the memorable three weeks at the camp, made new friends, got a tan, and was truly happy. As Brittany scrubbed the floors, memories of her school years flooded back, especially as she stumbled upon photographs her grandmother had carefully kept on the top shelf of a dresser. One of them featured Kevin and Brittany. She was starting first grade, and Kevin was already in seventh grade. Here are some photos from our graduation. Brittany hadn't seen some of her classmates since the last school prom. Some of them stayed in their hometown. Many, like Brittany, left for the capital. Corey moved to Hungary and enrolled in a technical university. Since the fifth grade, Brittany had secretly been in love with Corey. Honestly, many girls openly chased after him batted their eyelashes, and even confessed their love. Brittany never did anything like that. More often than not, she silently observed from the sidelines as Corey basked in all the female attention and sighed quietly. He never once looked her way because Brittany was too modest and unassertive. Over time, she gave up entirely and stopped paying any attention to the young man. That couldn't be said about Robin. Robin did everything she could to get Corey's attention. She dressed provocatively, started wearing makeup as early as seventh grade, changed hairstyles daily, and was constantly orbiting Corey. She didn't go unnoticed by the young man, but not for long. In the 10th grade, Corey became interested in Robin, and they even dated for a couple of months before Corey decided to break up with her. Robin didn't give up easily on Corey. She fought with his new girlfriends, threatened them, and even damaged their clothing in the locker room. In short, there was no shortage of drama to watch. Robin lived not far from Brittany's parents' home. Since returning to her hometown, Brittany had seen the audacious classmate a couple of times. The girl hadn't changed a bit in a year. She still dressed flamboyantly. Brittany's friend Anna said she was still hoping to win Corey back and couldn't wait for him to return to their hometown during the holidays. However, it seemed that Corey's new life had him firmly in its grip. It was already July, and he hadn't appeared in the town. While Brittany was cleaning, she missed a call from her mother. She had turned off the sound since the previous evening so that it wouldn't disturb her while she slept and had forgotten to turn it back on. Seeing several missed calls, she called her mother back. Mom. I'm sorry I didn't hear your call. Is everything okay over there? Brittany asked when she heard her mother's voice on the line. Yes, everything's fine, her daughter Kate reassured her. It's just that your father was asking yesterday why you went to your grandmother's. He said that your place is here. You should come back. He's already missing me, or he doesn't know who to boss around. The girl asked, Mom, please tell him I'm grown up and can decide where I want to live. Besides, I'm living with Grandma, helping her out. He should come over here and help fix the creaky porch boards. It's making such a noise I can hardly stand it. I'd fix it myself, but I don't know how. All right, sweetheart. I'll pass on the message about Grandma's house needing repairs, but I might skip the part about you being a grown-up who can decide things yourself. You know your father's temperament, the woman said, sounding concerned. I know. Mom, I know, Brittany reassured her mother. I'll stay here for another day or two and then come back home. Tell him not to worry. How are you doing? Is your heart okay? Everything's fine, dear. Don't worry, Kate comforted her daughter. Now, take care of everything there and come back. Having promised her mother not to linger, 
Brittany carried a bucket of water into the garden, poured it into a corner, and sat down on a bench. It was three in the afternoon, and the sun was scorching, making her want to escape its heat and find some shade. Apparently, the midday sun had also worn out her grandmother, who was peacefully sleeping in the living room, her hand under her head. Brittany, have you finished everything? Asked the elderly woman, getting up from the couch. Thank you, dear. Grandma, what's this important conversation you mentioned? Brittany understood that this was going to be about something truly significant. So she looked at her grandmother with attention. I'm not young anymore and I don't know how much longer I have to live. So, I've taken care of you. Just in case something happens to me, know that I'm leaving this house to you. I've already made out the will, Rachel informed Brittany, surprising her greatly. Grandma, please don't talk about this, she pleaded. What's with all this talk? You're going to be with me for a long time. I know, dear, I know but both you and I should be prepared for such an eventuality. Of course, Kevin might also want to be my heir, but as much as I love him, I haven't included him in the will. I know he'd sell my house on the first day he takes over. This house and garden mean a lot to me. I have so many wonderful memories here. Please take care of my house, Brittany. My hope rests on you alone, Rachel requested, looking lovingly at her granddaughter. Don't worry, Grandma. I'll do as you say, but let's stop this sad conversation. You're going to be with me for a long time. Brittany reiterated and kissed her grandmother. Brittany knew that her grandmother had worked as a nurse at the local hospital for many years. For some reason, Rachel had never married. At 28, she gave birth to Kate, Brittany's mother, and dedicated her entire life to her daughter. Rachel didn't like talking about her youth. Sometimes, Brittany felt that memories of her long-gone youth brought her grandmother pain, so she didn't pester her with questions. The owner of the car wash, Michael, was a greedy man and would go to great lengths for his own benefit. When the opportunity to collaborate with successful businessman Eric presented itself, he was overjoyed. He didn't postpone things and invited Derek over to discuss their joint project then, of course, to have a good time. So he and he turned to one of his subordinates. How should we entertain Derek? I'm not sure, Michael, he unscratched his head. Maybe we could take him to the sauna, offer him a good brandy to relax after a day's work. Yes, the sauna could work, Michael mused. But I have a feeling that won't impress him. We need to come up with something truly unusual, something he'll remember for a lifetime. Well, let's invite some girls. Jan suggested. Things are always more fun with girls. We could invite some of our beauties to our party fresh, young ones. But finding suitable ones that quickly might not be easy. Ian scratched his head again. You think, think, Ian. Michael shouted to his subordinate and gazed thoughtfully out the window. His thoughts were interrupted by a knock on the door. Kevin cautiously entered the office and looked obsequiously at his boss. Michael, did you want to see me? He stammered, addressing Michael. Yes, Kevin. When are you planning to repay your debt to me? It's been half a year, and you keep promising. Look, the interest is piling up, and you don't seem to be thinking about your sizable debt. Michael hissed, eyeing the young man. I'll pay you back. I promise, Kevin assured, attempting to exit the room. Wait, you're not getting away from me that easily. We haven't finished our discussion, Michael said thoughtfully, looking at Kevin again. Listen carefully. Try to do everything as I say. I'll do it. I'll do everything, Kevin began to promise, not yet realizing what was being discussed. On Sunday, Brittany decided to return home. Rachel sent her off to her relatives with a large bag full of homemade preserves, and Brittany struggled to carry it to her own doorstep. Need any help, young lady? A familiar voice made Brittany jump and turn around. Hey, Brittany, how have you been? Brittany couldn't believe her eyes. Standing before her was Corey, smiling from ear to ear. As always, he was dressed impeccably in light-colored trousers and a blue shirt that fit him like a glove. Corey, where did you come from? Brittany asked, surprised, and lowered her gaze, 
feeling self-conscious. I was just passing by. I saw you with this huge bag, so I decided to stop and help, Corey explained. Thank you, but you really didn't have to. I'm almost home. I could handle it myself, Brittany said and gripped the bag handles. In three swift moves, Corey effortlessly lifted the heavy bag and carried it up the stairs to the second floor. Well, here we are, he said, placing the bag by her apartment door. And you didn't even let me help you. So, Brittany, how about meeting up tonight? It's been so long. You can tell me how you're doing, how your studies are going, and what our old classmates are up to. There's not much to tell, Brittany replied quietly. I don't come to the city very often. All right then, you can tell me about yourself, Corey persisted. I'm heading out now, but I'll be waiting for you at the cinema at exactly seven. Deal. Brittany, who have you been talking to for the past half hour? Her father inquired. Dad, this is Corey, my classmate. Didn't you recognize him? Brittany asked and walked into the hallway. Her father closed the door behind her and, without offering to help with the jaws, began to pester her with questions. Corey, is he the mayor's son? Brittany, you're not as simple as you may seem. Doug started chattering. You're not wasting any time. Dad, what are you talking about? Brittany asked, pulling the jars out of her bag and arranging them on the shelves. Corey just happened to run into me and help me with my bags. Don't even try to fool me. A guy like that wouldn't just cling to you for no reason. He's into you. Doug mumbled to himself, as if speaking to himself. Don't even think about losing such a suitor. I never dreamed I'd become the mayor myself. Dad, stop talking nonsense. The girl interrupted her father and went to take a shower. Brittany knew that once her father got something into his head, it was nearly impossible to get those thoughts out. The cold water streamed down her body, serving as a reminder of the pitiful sight she had presented when Corey had caught her at the entrance. It was a hot day, and Brittany had sweated and become exhausted to the point where she could barely stand. Of all times to encounter the person you least expect to see, after turning off the water and drying her hair with a towel, Brittany stood in front of the mirror and gazed closely at her reflection. She saw a slender girl with disheveled long hair and large sad eyes looking back at her. Yeah, it's scary to look at, Brittany said to her reflection and stuck out her tongue. Her mother wasn't at home. Only her father, who had apparently returned from his night shift, seemed unsure of what to do with his time. Upon seeing that his daughter had left the bathroom, he once again wanted to pester her with questions about Corey. But Brittany quickly hid behind her bedroom door and locked it. She had no desire to talk to her father. The evening arrived imperceptibly. Brittany spent the entire day reading. She only remembered Corey around six in the evening. Should I go to the cinema or not? She pondered. Her previous infatuation with the young man had long faded. Of course, Corey was attractive to girls, but Brittany was convinced that she was entirely indifferent to him. Deciding that going to the movies was still a good idea, she began to get ready. She styled her hair, put it in a braid, donned a long blue dress, applied a minimal amount of makeup, and left her apartment. Her mother and Kevin weren't home yet, and her father was asleep on the couch. A crowd of people had gathered outside the movie theater. But Brittany noticed Corey immediately. As always, he looked impeccable, and he held an enormous bouquet of bright red roses. Brittany, you look absolutely stunning, the admiring young man said, handing her the flowers. You know, I never paid attention to you before, but today, when I saw you during the day, I couldn't take my eyes off you. Corey, stop joking like that. Have we missed the movie? Brittany attempted to change the subject. No, the show doesn't start for another 15 minutes, Corey replied. By the way, you might not believe me, but it's true. You can think whatever you want and understand however you can, but you really are a beauty. An absolutely stunning beauty, Corey continued to shower her with compliments. Okay, let's say I believe you, Brittany agreed. The young couple headed towards the cinema and within a few minutes, they took their seats in the auditorium. After the movie, Corey invited Brittany to take a walk along the waterfront, so she didn't return home until midnight. 
As expected, her parents and Kevin were still awake, all sitting in the kitchen, awaiting her return. To her surprise, her father didn't scold her. He simply looked at her with curiosity, as if not knowing how to start the conversation. Apparently, the prospect of marrying the mayor himself had genuinely excited him. Sweetie, Dad said you went for a walk with Corey. Is that true? Kate asked as soon as her daughter stepped through the apartment door. You've never come back so late before. Yes, Mom, I ran into Corey completely by chance today. We went to the movies, took a stroll through the town, and reminisced about our school years, Brittany replied indicating that she didn't want to continue the conversation. Keep it up, Sess, Kevin praised her. Don't waste time. Reel and Corey and marry him. Stop talking nonsense, Kevin. Brittany sharply cut off her brother. I'm not planning to marry anyone, and I don't need Corey. What? You're going to turn down such a suitor. Her father chimed in. Leave Brittany alone, their mother commanded, which greatly helped her daughter. Brittany slept away into her room, not wanting to continue the empty conversation. About half an hour later, the apartment fell silent. After taking a bath, the young woman lay under her blanket and began to reminisce about all the events of the day. It's so strange, she thought. I never thought I'd meet Corey, and he'd pay attention to me. He used to pay no attention to me at all, but now he suddenly realized that he's attracted to me. Could it be true? I hope I don't fall for him again. Her thoughts gradually became sluggish, started to tangle, and soon the girl fell into a deep sleep, not waking up until morning. A few days passed, and strangely enough, Corey continued to court Brittany. Almost every day, there was a bouquet of fresh flowers at her doorstep. Saturday seemed like an ordinary day. Brittany had managed to visit her grandmother to help with gardening and had cleaned the apartment. Her mother was delayed at the market, so she decided to prepare dinner without her. Her father was on his shift, and, as usual, no one knew Kevin's whereabouts. Most assumed he was at work in the auto repair shop, and if it wasn't his shift today, he was probably occupied with his own activities. Brittany hummed softly to herself as she worked at the stove. Delicious aromas wafted from the kitchen, and soon the soup would be ready. Brittany, Brittany, Hell, Kevin's voice was more alarmed than ever. Barely managing to turn off the stove and cover the pot with a lid, the girl rushed to her brother. Kevin was sitting in the hallway on the floor, his face hidden in his hands. Brittany noticed that his hands, neck, and forehead were smeared with blood. His clothes were soiled and dusty, and his hair was unnaturally disheveled. Kevin, what happened to you? Were you beaten? Brittany exclaimed, frightened as she approached her brother. Help me get up and bring me to the bathroom, the young man requested. Just hurry, I don't want our parents to see me like this. Brittany did as Kevin asked, bringing him a towel and tending to the scrapes on his hands and face. When her brother had calmed down a bit, she approached him and asked for an explanation of what had happened. Brittany, only you can help me, only you, Kevin implored his sister. I've gotten myself into real trouble. If you refuse to help me, they'll kill me. In a week, I'll be gone. You understand? No, I don't understand at all. Explain it properly, the girl demanded. You see, I was driving my friend's car today. I had an urgent job to complete outside of the city. It just happened that I accidentally hit a young guy, about 14 or 15 years old. Turns out, he's the son of some well-known businessman. The kid got minor injuries, just a few scrapes and a couple of bruises. I managed to hit the brakes in time and stop. But an hour later, these people caught me, took me to some garage, and beat me so badly that I could barely escape. Now, they're demanding a huge sum of money from me. If I don't bring them the money, they're threatening to lock me up. Can you imagine what a mess I'm in? Kevin recounted his story, his eyes filled with fear. Wait, Kevin. But you said the kid only got a few scratches. Report this to the police. They should handle this kind of vigilantism. Brittany advised her brother. What police? What police? You don't understand who I'm talking about. They will bury me immediately if I complain to the police. Only you can help me. 
Kevin said, his eyes beseeching his sister. But how can I help you? Brittany asked, still not comprehending. That's exactly how you can help. They asked for you to come to the Radisson Hotel on the waterfront tonight at 11. They promised to leave me alone if I fulfill this request. Kevin explained hesitantly, never lifting his gaze from the floor. Go to the hotel. Me. But why do they need me? Brittany puzzled. You'll go and find out. You won't leave me in trouble, sis. It won't cost you much, right? They'll probably offer you a job as a waitress or a maid. I'm not sure, but we need to earn the money. And the only way to repay the debt is by earning it somewhere. They mention some kind of work. We'll collect the necessary amount faster if we do it together. I'll be nearby to watch over you, just in case, Kevin implored his sister, kneeling in front of her. Okay, Brittany agreed and potted her brother's head. Just don't tell our parents anything. You know mom has a weak heart. Kevin tried to protect himself. I know, I won't say anything to them. The girl assured her brother and went to her room. Brittany felt that something was amiss in this situation, but she couldn't quite put her finger on it. For some reason, she wanted to trust Kevin. After all, he was her brother. When their parents returned, Brittany did her best to hide her concerns. Kevin remained in his room, saying that he was too tired after work and didn't want to eat. As usual, their parents went to bed at 10 in the evening. Brittany began to prepare herself to leave the house. Just past 11, Kevin emerged from his room. Brittany put on jeans, a t-shirt, and a sweater, neatly braided her hair, and quietly closed the door behind her. Outside the entrance, a black car was waiting for her. Kevin was sitting next to the driver and waved at her. Realizing she couldn't afford to delay any longer, Brittany got into the back seat of the car. She still didn't fully grasp the gravity of the situation. She thought that her brother would be around during the conversation in the evening. Kevin opened the car door for her, and as soon as he realized she couldn't escape, he slammed it shut. The car began to move. Brittany realized that besides the driver, there was another person in the car, sitting next to the driver and trying not to reveal their face. The person wore a wide-brimmed hat making it nearly impossible to see anything in the dark car's interior. However, Brittany noticed the man's hands, which were clearly visible in the headlights of passing cars. His long, bony fingers were so thin and extended that it sent a shiver down her spine. The man sat, rubbing his hands together as if restraining himself from something highly desired. Brittany, is that your name? The stranger inquired. Yes. Brittany answered as confidently as she could. Where are you taking me? And what do you want from me? Kevin explained some things, but I'd like to know more. What exactly will I have to do to keep you away from my brother? Well, you're quite feisty, the stranger remarked. Don't think for a moment that you're not brave and resourceful. I'm quite taken with you. I think you'll do an excellent job with the task we're about to give you. What task? Stop speaking in riddles, Brittany demanded as she gazed out of the window. She realized she was being taken out of town. The forested area had already begun, but she couldn't understand which way they were going. Twenty minutes later, the driver pulled over to the side of the road and turned off the headlights. Brittany felt that she was on the verge of fainting from fear, but she did her best not to show it. Listen carefully to me and try to do everything as I say. The man in the hat began to explain. In five minutes, we will arrive at a large country house. Some very respectable people have gathered there. Your task is to bring food to the room where they are resting and set the table. There are two other girls working in the house, so you won't be bored. Got it? Yes, Brittany replied quietly, feeling her throat dry up from fear. The rest of the journey unfolded as the stranger had warned. After arriving at the house, her companion exited the car first. When he disappeared through the front doors, the driver allowed the girl to exit and escorted her to a secondary entrance on the other side of the building. In the hallway, two girls wearing identical short, light dresses and high-heeled shoes greeted her. At last, one of them said, We thought we'd never see you. Come on, hurry up. We need to get ready to go out. 
and you look like this. What's wrong with my appearance? Brittany protested. I'll be working in my jeans and a t-shirt. Have you lost your mind? The other girl tried to reason with her. They'll kick you out of this house in no time with that look. Brittany wanted to say she'd be glad to leave this place, but she remembered her brother and remained silent. Here, put this on quickly, one of the girls commanded, pointing to an identical dress to what they were wearing. Brittany changed her clothes. The girls applied bold makeup and let her hair down. Brittany looked at herself in the mirror and shuddered. She had never seen herself like this before. For a moment, she felt like she was looking at a complete stranger. Well, are you ready, girls? A stranger, Ian, suddenly appeared in the room. Yes, Ian, we're always ready. Her new acquaintances chorused and smiled. Go from here for a minute. I need to have a word with the newcomer. Ian commanded and looked at Brittany with a satisfied expression. So, listen to me carefully, he said. I hope you understand that you didn't end up here just to pour drinks. What do you mean by that? Brittany asked, realizing she was in a terrible situation. If you don't do what I'm about to tell you, you will never see your brother again. So, be smart and listen to us. Right now, you Molly and Joanna will leave the hall after setting the table and return here in a while. But remember, your work doesn't end there. Your precious brother's life is worth much more. You'll have to serve the guests in every sense of the word. By the way, your client is the most important one among them. His name is Derek. You'll recognize him immediately. Tall, slim, young, dressed in light trousers and a shirt. Also, he's the most sober among the guests, sitting in the armchair by the fireplace, silently observing. Be prepared. After the banquet is over, you'll meet him in the room on the second floor. I'll escort you there. But remember the most important thing. If he starts asking who you are and what you're doing here, you must answer that you're working like the other girls here. Do you understand? Brittany listened but remained silent. It was only now that she realized her worst assumptions had turned out to be true and that escaping from this house was unlikely. Why are you silent? Or have you forgotten about your brother? If you do as I explain, we'll leave Kevin alone. The man repeated and continued to scrutinize the girl with his eyes. Okay, I'll do everything as you said, Brittany replied softly. It felt like she wasn't the one speaking. She felt like a completely different person. Her head was spinning, and nausea crept up her throat. Well, that's great. If we've reached an agreement, it's time to get to work, he unsaid, inviting Joanna and Molly back into the room. Girls, get started. Brittany followed her new acquaintances to the kitchen, placed a jug of some pink liquid and four glasses on a tray, along with some fruits. After a couple of minutes, she entered the room where the men were relaxing and turned pale with fear. Seated on the sofa was the owner of the auto shop where Kevin worked, Michael, the city's mayor, Lucas, an unfamiliar man, and Corey, more surprised by her presence than anyone else in the room. He jumped up from his seat and walked over to Brittany. Well, this is something. I didn't expect to see you here, he exclaimed loudly as he approached Brittany. So, all this time, you pretended to be a modest and sweet girl, but in reality, you're just an ordinary. Corey interrupted his speech and dashed out of the room. The other men sat in silence, observing Brittany. Fortunately, Molly and Joanna had joined the task of pouring drinks. Brittany felt terrible. Shame, fear, horror, and hopelessness mingled in her soul, making it hard to breathe. Are you feeling unwell? An unfamiliar man asked, taking her hand. It's stuffy in here, and you can't breathe. Your hands are so cold, as if you've been out in the cold. So, warm me up, Brittany whispered, realizing that the man before her was the Derek Yen had recently told her about. The man didn't waste any time, firmly took her hand, and led her to his room. In the morning, Brittany woke up in an unfamiliar bed. Remembering the events of the previous evening, she felt sick. She was alone in the room. Judging by the sound of water behind the wall, Brittany realized that the man she had spent the night with was taking a shower. She quickly got out of bed and decided to escape before anyone saw her. 
However, she only found the dress that had been given to her upon her arrival at the country house. Brittany grabbed her head and tried to remember which room she had left her clothes in. As she sat on the bed, unsure of what to do, Derek came out of the shower and looked at her intently. Brittany, that seems to be your name. Please answer my question. Why did you come to this house last night? He asked, sitting on the edge of the bed. Derek was wearing a robe and held a large terry towel in his hands. Isn't it obvious why? Why are you asking? I decided to earn some money, just like my friends, she replied, not daring to look in Derek's direction. But you don't seem like a woman of easy virtue. I want to know why you're here. The man repeated his question. Brittany covered her face with her hands, trying to hold back tears. But her slender shoulders twitched, betraying her attempt to evade the answer. I already answered your question. She replied softly. Please help me find my clothes. The house is big, and I don't remember in which room I changed yesterday. Derek didn't respond to the girl's request. He left the room in silence but returned a few minutes later with a bag in his hand. Perhaps these are yours. Get dressed and meet me outside. I'll be waiting for you in the yard, he said, tossing the bag onto the bed and then closed the door behind him. Brittany quickly put on her jeans and t-shirt. She didn't bother with the little cardigan. It was already 10 in the morning, and the sun shone brightly, making it quite hot. Bending down to tie her sneakers, she caught a glimpse of her reflection in the mirror. Disheveled hair, huge blue eyes filled with shame and horror, lips bedding until they bled it barely resembled her former self. Brittany felt like she was looking at a complete stranger in the mirror. Oh God, what have you done? How could you sink so low? She asked herself and turned away from the mirror. It was revolting for her to look at herself, to see the walls of this room, to be in this terrible house. Brittany left the bedroom, walked down a short hallway to the stairs, and descended. Fortunately, no one in the house crossed her path. When she entered the room where she had met Corey yesterday, she began to feel sick. Heavy thoughts tormented Brittany, so she hurried out to the yard to leave this dreadful place as quickly as possible and attempt to forget it forever. Derek was waiting for her in the yard next to his large black SUV. He asked her to get into the car and open the door for her. Brittany gave him her address, then closed her eyes again. Being near this man made her uncomfortable. On the way, Derek didn't press her with questions. They drove in silence, each lost in their own thoughts. Brittany had no idea what Derek was thinking. She was sure that he despised her. She despised herself too. She couldn't comprehend how to live after everything that had happened and she was afraid of what her parents would say when they found out. How would her mother, with her weak heart, react to the news? What would her father, who had never shown much fatherly love, do to her? Upon arriving, Brittany silently got out of the car and, without a word of goodbye, closed the car door. The man quickly drove away, and Brittany remained still for a few more minutes. Her legs wouldn't carry her back toward the house. Well, you're back. Corey's voice brought her back to reality. You've been working for quite a while, girl. It's already daytime, and you still haven't returned from your ship. Did you earn a lot last night? Brittany tried to avoid the persistent young man, but he continued to follow her, yelling to the whole yard. People, look at her. The way Brittany can act is beyond any professional actress. I believed in her, wanted to marry her, Corey shouted. Brittany saw the curiosity in the eyes of grandmothers sitting on benches and neighbors rushing to the nearest store. The open windows of the house allowed more spectators to witness this bizarre scene. Corey, go home and get some sleep. The girl attempted to dismiss the persistent young man. Sensing the alcohol on his breath, evidently, Corey had been drinking all night without taking a break. Darling, where have you been? Kate asked, rushing out to the yard. Who do you resemble? Let's get you cleaned up quickly. My goodness, what happened to you? Brittany hugged her mother and burst into tears. She cried as she had never cried before. Mom, forgive me. Mommy, please forgive me. She repeated the same phrase, climbing the stairs. You've returned, you disgrace. 
Doug shouted loudly and struck his daughter with a belt as she stood at the threshold, announcing that her suitor had been yelling in the yard for over an hour, declaring what a terrible person she was. Why do you keep disgracing us? Doug struck Brittany several more times and fell to his knees, crying. Brittany could no longer endure the beatings and humiliation. She dashed out of the apartment and ran to her grandmother's house. She didn't stop once on her way, only collapsing onto Rachel's couch when she reached it. The elderly woman didn't press her with questions, understanding that her granddaughter had experienced something terrible, something she would share when she calmed down. About an hour later, Brittany grew quiet, stopped crying, and eventually fell asleep. But her sleep was restless. She would twitch and jerk as stress and the horrors she had experienced continued to haunt her every moment. When she woke up, it was already three in the afternoon. I wish I could just sleep forever and forget everything, she said as soon as she opened her eyes. Why would you say something like that? Rachel chided her granddaughter. Life is a gift, and you should cherish it. Let's get up. I've brewed some camomile. Go freshen up and calm down. No one will hurt you here. Brittany struggled to get up from the couch and headed to the shower. She took off her dirty clothes and started washing her body. The scrapes and bruises stung even more under the water. But this physical pain was nothing compared to the emotional agony she was going through. Physical wounds will heal. But when will this emotional pain pass? Will I ever be able to forget all of this? She wondered as she scrubbed her body with a sponge. Two weeks passed. Brittany continued to stay at her grandmother's and didn't return home. She also hadn't seen Kevin, and she had no idea what he was up to. But the absence of any news about an unfortunate incident gave her hope that the sacrifice she made wasn't in vain. Rachel didn't pry into what had happened to her granddaughter. The elderly woman could see that Brittany had a hard time revisiting the events she had experienced. So she decided to wait until the day Brittany was ready to share everything. After a week, Brittany started getting ready for school. August was coming to an end, and it was time to think about her studies. Rachel went out to get the necessary supplies herself. She didn't return alone but with Brittany's mother, Kate. Kate was uneasy but didn't want to show herself to Rachel because of Doug, who had threatened to kick her out of the house if she dared to meet her daughter. Brittany, how are you here? Kate asked her daughter as soon as she crossed the threshold of their family home. Everything's fine, Mom. Don't worry. You know, you have a weak heart. Everything is so calm at Grandma's, and I don't even want to leave, Brittany replied, hugging her mother. I'll be starting school soon. I hope the classes will distract me and help me forget everything. How is Kevin doing? Kevin, the same as ever. What could be new with him? Kate wondered. That's just it. Dad is worrying me. He can't seem to move on at all. I hope he gradually forget everything. But this time he's not giving up. You shouldn't return home for now. It's better for everyone. Eventually, everything will settle down and be forgotten and then you can come back. Of course, Mom. Don't worry. I understand everything. Brittany reassured your mother. I don't want to see Dad either. Sweetheart, you never did tell me what happened to you. There are all sorts of rumors going around in the neighborhood. But I know they're all untrue. You're a pure and bright young woman. Your father gets really angry when he hears these rumors. And your Corey turned out to be a scoundrel. He defaced the front door with nasty words. It took Doug and me a lot of effort to clean it up. Your father is especially upset because he had dreamed of aligning with the mayor. So he's acting so aggressively now, Kate speculated but I never told him that I intended to marry Corey. Brittany interjected, cutting her mother official sure. He courted me, professed his love, gave me flowers, but I don't love him, and I'm certainly not serious about him. Mom, I don't want to talk about this, but you should know that I haven't done anything wrong. You often say that with time, everything will be forgotten and resolved. So let's just live and wait for that moment. After seeing her mother off, Brittany began to get ready to leave. She and her grandmother spent the evening in the kitchen. Rachel recounted stories from her youth. Grandma, 
Why didn't you ever get married? Brittany asked. She had wanted to ask Rachel this question for a long time, but hesitated, sensing that the elderly woman didn't like discussing the topic. It wasn't meant to be for me to get married, Rachel sighed. You see, I'm the kind of person who, when they fall in love, they do it just once, and that's for life. I loved a young man deeply. He was eight years younger than me, and he told me he loved me, even proposed to me, but I declined. Why? You both loved each other. Brittany expressed her surprise, taking her grandmother's hands. Well, you see, he was a very complicated person. More accurately, his parents were the difficult ones. They would never have approved of our marriage. I had just started working at the hospital then. We had an affluent and haughty woman admitted to our war. It turned out to be his mother. She often boasted about finding a suitable bride for her only son, someone who matched their status and met all her requirements. She had no idea that I was the girl confessing her love to her son. She was discharged, and soon I realized that I was pregnant. Knowing that I had no place in their family life, I ran away from the man I love and never saw him again. I gave birth to Kate and tried to forget about him. The elderly woman confided. And did you forget? Did you succeed? Brittany inquired. No, Rachel shook her head. Sometimes I feel like I still love him as I did before. Did you never want to meet him again? Brittany continued with her questioning. Of course I did. But what's the point of discussing this now? Rachel made it clear that she wanted to end the conversation. Wait, Grandma. So, does this man never know that he has a daughter, my mother? Brittany asked another question. Why would he need to know that? He has his own family and his own child. We lived our lives the way they unfolded, and there's no point in regretting it. Rachel wiped a tear and tried to compose herself. Brittany realized that these memories were unpleasant for her grandmother, so she decided to drop the subject. She really wanted to know who this person was, but she understood that asking her grandmother such questions would be futile. I want to show you something, Rachel suddenly remembered, digging into a small box. Found it, take a look. This heart-shaped pendant was a gift from your grandfather, Kate's father. He said it was specially made for him, one of a kind, and it would bring me happiness. I never wore it, but I want it to belong to you. Thank you, Grandma. Brittany thanked the old lady. I guess it's very valuable. Look at how it shimmers. I never inquired about its value, but I believe it's worth quite a bit. Its worth lies not in its price, but in the memories of good old times when we thought the future was cloudless, Rachel explained. The next day, Brittany was saying her goodbyes to her grandmother. Brittany could breathe more easily and decided not to dwell on that terrible summer. But just a week later, she realized that she was forever bound to everything that happened in the countryside house. Her classes at the institute had just begun. In her dorm room, where Brittany lived, a new girl named Laura had moved in. She had transferred from another college and was thrilled to be far from her parents. From the very first days, she displayed a difficult character. She didn't want to clean the room, let alone take turns with floor duties. The attractive newcomer caught the eye of the gods, and she herself had no objections to going out and having fun in the company of young people. After meeting Brittany, Laura immediately understood that she was out of luck with her roommate. She assumed that Brittany would be studying, reading books, and that there would be no boys allowed in their room. Brittany, why are you such a bore? Lori asked one day while getting ready in front of the mirror. Let's go out, have some fun. No, I don't feel like it. I'll tidy up and make dinner. Brittany replied and got up from her bed. It's Saturday today, and I just feel like getting some order in here. Look at how dirty the room is. Laura made a noise and began to carefully apply mascara to her eyelashes. Brittany went to the bathroom, filled a bucket with water and returned to the room to start cleaning the windows. As she stood up on a chair, she suddenly fainted. She came to on her bed, with Laura and Vivian, a friend and fellow student living on the floor below, hovering over her. You scared us, Brittany, Vivian said. 
Did you hit yourself hard when you fell to the floor? No, I don't think anything hurts. Just my head feels heavy, and I feel a little nauseous, Brittany said, feeling queasiness again. Maybe I ate something bad. My stomach has been bothering me for a few days. Listen, Brittany, could you possibly be pregnant? Laura suggested. You should go to the doctor. Well, I'm running late already. You guys figure it out without me. Leaving behind a faint trace of perfume, Laura disappeared behind the door. Upon catching a whiff of the perfume, Brittany began to feel sick again. She barely made it to the bathroom, where she stayed for about 15 minutes. When she returned to the room, she found Vivian deep in thought. Brittany, I think Laura might be right. You should see a doctor. You say you've been feeling nauseous for a few days now. Come on, tell me. Did you meet someone over the summer, and something happened between you two? Come on, spill it. Vivian wasn't going to let Brittany off the hook. I didn't do anything. Stop making things up. I'm not pregnant. Brittany tried to evade the question. So, there was something after all, Vivian guessed. You could buy a test from the pharmacy to be absolutely sure. No, on Monday. I'm going to the hospital first thing in the morning. Who knows, the test might give an incorrect result. But the doctor should be accurate, Brittany said and laid back on her bed. She felt awful. Alone in her room, she couldn't calm herself down for a long time. She couldn't deny the fact of her pregnancy, even though she didn't want to entertain the thought. Sunday passed unnoticed. Laura called to let her know she wouldn't be back to the dorm until Monday. It seemed like she had decided to have a fun-filled weekend. Brittany was left alone to relax and contemplate the situation. She eagerly awaited Monday morning, hoping her fears wouldn't come true and that it was just a matter of eating something bad. Givian came by several times. They started looking for jobs together. Vivian was also from a less fortunate family and needed extra work. The girls wanted to find waitressing or hospital orderly positions so they could work in the evenings. Brittany, I called today about an ad I found online. One of the city cafes is looking for waitresses. The job is from 3 p.m. to 8 p.m., which suits us perfectly. Let's go check it out after class tomorrow, Vivian suggested, coming by her friend's room for the fifth time. Brittany understood that Vivian was worried about her and was trying to distract her from her heavy thoughts. Her friend had attempted several times to get Brittany to confess what had happened in the two short summer months, but she couldn't get a single word out of her. Okay, Brittany agreed. Just make sure to cover for me in the morning during classes. I'll run to the hospital and come back to the institute. After class, we'll figure out the job situation. The night was long and sleepless. Brittany did fall asleep at some point, but she had a nightmare in which the events in the big country house were repeated in every detail. She woke up in terror, with sweat on her forehead. Her hands trembled, and she had difficulty catching her breath. After a few moments, Brittany got out of bed, poured a glass of water from the pitcher, and drank it in one go. She then crawled back under her covers, but could only fall asleep as dawn broke. The alarm clock went off precisely at 7 a.m., and when Brittany got out of bed, she still felt unwell. Nausea swelled in her throat, her head spun, and a headache added to the misery. After hastily tidying herself up, she decided to head straight to the hospital. The trip to the hospital would take a little over half an hour. Troubling thoughts prevented Brittany from enjoying the wonderful September morning, the clear blue sky, and the bright sun. The doctors didn't start taking patients until 8.30 a.m. Brittany was the third in line, so she decided to read a book while she waited. Having finally made her way to the doctor's office, Brittany described her condition and looked at the physician with hope. The doctor examined her, took detailed notes in her chart, asked a couple of additional questions, and then delivered the news that the young woman would soon have a child. Additionally, the doctor recommended against having an abortion, stating that it was inadvisable due to her RH factor. Brittany knew that if she underwent an abortion, she might have difficulty getting pregnant again in the future. Brittany sat on a bench in the hospital courtyard, unsure of what to do next. 
She realized that she was the only one to blame for everything that had happened. Going back home was not an option, and she would likely have to forget about her studies for the time being. A phone call distracted her from her heavy thoughts. It was Vivian, who had been waiting for her at the Institute. Hello, Vivian. Don't wait for me. I won't be coming to class today, Brittany informed her. What did they tell you at the hospital? Did Laura's assumptions come true? Are you pregnant? Vivian asked, firing one question after another. Let's talk about everything tonight. Right now, I'm having a hard time understanding what's happening. Brittany explained and turned off her phone. She walked through the hospital park without paying much attention to her surroundings. The fallen leaves rustled beneath her feet, and her face was gently kissed by the light breeze, while the sun provided its last warmth of the day. Brittany realized she had reached the pond when she sat down on a bench. There was nothing around her except for an elderly man standing at the water's edge, feeding the ducks. It was at this moment that Brittany remembered her grandmother. She was the one who could offer her genuinely kind advice. Without much contemplation, she dialed the familiar number. Rachel didn't keep her waiting for long. Within a few seconds, she heard her grandmother's familiar voice. Grandma, it's good to hear your voice. How are you holding up there all alone? Brittany asked, not knowing where to start the conversation. I'm doing just fine, my dear. I miss you, of course, but I manage. How are you doing? I can sense from your voice that things aren't going well, Rachel guessed. You can't hide anything from me, Grandma. Brittany replied and burst into tears. All right, take a deep breath and tell me what happened. Even better, come over to my place. Take a few days off and come here. Do you hear me, Brittany? Her grandmother insisted. Okay, I will. Brittany agreed and hung up the phone. Upon arriving at the Institute, Brittany wrote a request asking to be excused from her classes for a few days and then left for her grandmother's house. By eight in the evening, she was sitting in the kitchen across from her grandmother, who was carefully pouring tea into a cup. So, enough of this silence. Tell me what's going on. I waited all summer for you to tell me everything, but I didn't hear a word. You don't look very well. Are you sick by any chance? Rachel asked, stroking her granddaughter's head. No, Grandma, I'm healthy. It's just... Brittany didn't know how to break the news of her pregnancy to her grandmother and fell silent again. Come on, Brittany, you must tell me everything. Whatever happened, I'll understand and support you, Rachel said noticing tears on her granddaughter's face. Grandma, I'm pregnant, and it seems like I'll be raising the child on my own. Brittany finally confessed and burst into tears. Pregnant? Well, that's a blessing, my girl. Rachel surprised Brittany with her response. Brittany had expected anything but this. What do you mean, a blessing? Grandma, you understand I'll have to raise my baby on my own, right? There won't be a father. Brittany tried to express her concerns. I raised your mother on my own too, dear. Remember, I told you I never told your grandfather about her. And just like that, you will raise your child. The elderly woman tried to reassure her granddaughter. And maybe he won't mind having the baby. Don't repeat my mistakes, my dear. Tell your young man everything. What young man? There is no young man, and I'll never see him again. You understand. I won't see him again. Brittany continued to cry. I don't understand a thing. You'll have to tell me everything. Who is the father of your child? Rachel inquired, making it clear she wouldn't back down until she got a clear answer. Brittany had to recount everything to her grandmother. From Kevin, who had been targeted for assassination, to the country house she ended up in against her will, and Derek whom she was supposed to spend the night with to save her brother. Upon hearing all of this, Rachel remained silent for a long time, gently stroking her granddaughter's head and lost in thought. So, my own grandson treated you this way. But you should have thought very carefully before agreeing to his request. You know how much of a scoundrel he can be. Of course, I shouldn't speak of my own grandson this way, but in this case, I can't call him anything else. The elderly woman whispered, clenching her fists. 
The pain, regret, anger, and hopelessness from everything that had happened weighed heavily on her chest. Rachel had suspected that something unpleasant had occurred with her granddaughter, but to this extent, it's too late to talk about it now. What's done is done. We have to live for today and think about what to do next, Rachel said, moving her chair closer to her granddaughter. Do you know who this Derek is? Where he lives and what he does? Grandma, what are you talking about? Brittany interrupted her grandmother. I don't know, and I don't want to know. He's just as awful as his friends. They were all partying at that house that night, celebrating something. What was I to them? How did I appear before Derek? You see, Grandma, he'll never acknowledge my child, and he won't remember me. Honestly, I'll never go to him, and I won't ask him for anything. You're probably right. Together, you and I will raise our little one. Now, go back to the city, focus on your studies, and don't worry about anything. When my great-grandchild is born, you can come back to me. I'll help you in every way I can. My pension is meager, but I have some savings, Rachel offered to her granddaughter. All right, Grandma, just don't tell my parents anything. There's no need for them to know what happened to me. Let Kevin live his life, Brittany requested. They sat in the kitchen for a long time, making plans for the future. But little did they know what the future truly held for them. Gradually, Brittany's life started to fall into place. Of course, pregnancy made her see things differently. She began taking better care of herself, dressing more warmly. Money wasn't always enough for fruits, vegetables, and vitamins, but she didn't lose hope. Doctors at every checkup assured her that her baby was developing well. Brittany was due to give birth in early May. She was offered the opportunity to take her exams early and go on academic leave for a year. She also started working at the local archives. The work wasn't too demanding, but it didn't bring in much money either. However, it allowed her to save a small amount for the future and buy things for the baby. In November, she found out she was expecting a son. She decided to name him Paul, though she didn't know why. She just liked the name. Brittany visited her grandmother approximately once a month. On her latest visit to her grandmother in early December, Brittany ran into her mother, Kate. Kate had found out about her daughter's pregnancy from the neighbors, and kind-hearted people had informed Doug as well. However, he still didn't want to see Brittany, considering her a disgrace to the family. Darling, I've missed you so much, Kate said, hugging Brittany. And your belly is already rounding. Well, I'm about to become a grandmother. You and mom are real conspirators. You didn't tell anyone about the pregnancy, Brittany joked. I'm sorry, mom. I didn't want to burden you with my problems. I know how dad would react to all of this. It's strange that he's not here right now. Otherwise, he'd have another opportunity to take it out on me, Brittany said, recalling how her father had greeted her after that dreadful night. I can't fathom it, dear. He's acting like a beast, refusing to listen to anyone, as if none of us have the right to make mistakes, Kate sighed. But tell me, how have you been living, studying? I've been thinking about you constantly. Brittany shared with her mother how she had been living all this time and her plans for the future. She also inquired about Kevin. Kevin is still the same, working, and he's gotten involved with a bad crowd. He's causing me heartache. I'm worried that something might happen to him, Kate shared her concerns. Don't worry, Mom. Kevin is his own master. No one can tell him what to do, Brittany reassured her mother and poured her some herbal tea. Only Grandma knows how to brew this kind of herbal tea. In the spring, we'll be back here with the baby. Come visit us more often. We'll always be happy to see you. Of course, my dear. But please take care of yourself and call me more often. Only during the day, not in the evening. When your father hears that you've called me, he doesn't give me any peace. I don't know what to do with him, Kate complained about her life once again. Here, Brittany, I've saved up a little money for you. Take it, don't refuse. Thank you, Mom. I earn my own living. You'll need the money yourself. Don't forget to see a doctor regularly, 
Brittany declined the money her mother offered. The evening flew by during their conversation, and the night passed peacefully. However, Brittany woke up the next morning with abdominal pain. Her grandmother noticed something was wrong and immediately called an ambulance. Doctors arrived within 20 minutes, and after examining the young woman, they decided to admit her to the hospital. Don't worry, dear, everything will be fine, Rachel reassured her granddaughter, gathering her belongings. The important thing is to listen to the doctors and avoid getting nervous. All right, Grandma, please let Mom know to visit me in the hospital, Brittany requested as she struggled to find a place in the ambulance. In the hospital room where they had placed the young woman, there lay a woman around 40 years of age. She was eight months pregnant and had been talking endlessly on the phone. From her conversations, Brittany understood that she already had two children who she had left in her husband's care. She worried about how they were managing at home without her. She was so engrossed in her phone call that she didn't immediately notice her new neighbor. When the woman finally finished her call and scrutinized Brittany, she said, Well, hello, neighbor. I'm Kristen. What's your name? Hello. I'm Brittany. The young woman introduced herself and closed her eyes. She had been extremely nervous and couldn't seem to calm down. The pain in her abdomen had subsided a bit after taking medication, so now she just wanted to lie down and not think about anything. However, her new acquaintance, it appeared, wasn't going to leave her alone. Tell me, Brittany, how old are you? Kristen asked an impolite question. I'm 18. Did you think I was still in high school? Brittany inquired. Well, you look like a young girl. How did you end up pregnant so early? Oh, you, you've messed up your life and your child's. Kristen continued the unpleasant conversation. So, do you have a husband? I see there's no ring on your finger, so you're not married. What's wrong with not being married? I'll raise my child alone. I'm neither the first nor the last. Brittany began to defend herself from Kristen. That's true, Kristen sighed but you still don't know how challenging it is to raise a child on your own. My eldest is already 20, and I still remind her several times a day that she started having children too early. First, you should get an education, get married, and only then think about kids. Do you think I'm just saying this? No. I raised my little girl on my own until she was eight. I had her when I was 20, just like you, and without a husband. I went through a lot. I had to work to feed, clothe, and shelter the child, and I couldn't sleep at night. It was hell, to say the least. I wouldn't wish anyone to go through that. No, please. Don't tell me about it, Brittany requested, making it clear that this conversation was unpleasant for her. But Kristen, apparently, had no intention of letting Brittany off the hook. On the contrary, she wanted to impart some life lessons and push her to the brink. You'll see that I'm right. When are you due to give birth in the spring? You're not answering. But I can see your stage. Kristen continued to hound Brittany. Is it going to be a boy or a girl for you? A son, Brittany replied quietly and turned toward the wall. The only thing she wanted now was peace and quiet. Kristen, understanding that her young neighbor didn't wish to continue the conversation, went back to her phone and started calling her friends this time. The phone call went on for over half an hour, until finally, the two women finished their conversation and bid each other goodbye. Brittany lay silently on the bed, mulling over the words of her new acquaintance. It was at this moment that she realized the difficulties she would face after the baby was born. Thankfully, she had her grandmother, who would definitely not leave her without shelter and support. As long as she remained healthy, Brittany was only allowed to get out of bed on the third day. Of course, she had gotten up in the first few days after being admitted to the hospital, but only briefly. Now she was permitted to walk down the hallway. As she strolled down the long corridor, she noticed that there was a lot of medical staff gathered around room 17. She didn't know who was in there, but she immediately sensed that the patient was quite extraordinary. You'll regret it if you don't do everything as I said. Call my father to me. The woman inside the room yelled, surprising the ordinary patients on the ward. 
Apparently, no one wanted to argue with this capricious woman, so the hospital staff silently left her room and hurried back to their duties. Kristen, do you know who's in room 17? Brittany asked her roommate, thinking she must have the inside scoop. Kristen explained that there were several VIP rooms in the war, and room 17 was one of them. It was occupied by Diane, the daughter of a billionaire who owned a massive construction company. The young woman was terribly spoiled and believed that everyone should serve her. She had been admitted to the ward a few days ago with a threatened miscarriage. Since then, the hospital staff had lost their peace and sleep, catering to her every whim. Her father had been in the hospital several times, and he seemed to be a very intelligent and polite man. You should see how splendidly he's dressed, how elegant and courteous he is. How could such a person have a daughter like that? I don't understand. Perhaps these millionaires have no time for raising their children. Kristen shared her thoughts. Brittany listened to her roommate and pondered how different life could be. What could be missing for this wealthy young woman to behave so rudely, belittling and offending those around her? She should be happy that she would soon become a mother. Maybe she had a husband who was just as wealthy and dependable. But what did Brittany have? Nothing. Just her grandmother's old house and her grandmother herself. The only person who could truly support and help her. Of course, there was her mother, but her life with her father and brother was far from ideal, and Brittany didn't want to burden her with her own problems. She felt sorry for her mother and was concerned about her fragile health. In the evening, when all the patients in the ward were getting ready to sleep, Brittany decided to take another walk down the corridor. The room had become stuffy, and the hallway offered cooler air. She didn't expect that as she passed room 17, she would walk into an unpleasant situation. Brittany didn't notice that the door to the room was slightly ajar. She was walking down the corridor peacefully when someone grabbed her by the sleeve and pulled her inside the room. Before she could react, she found herself inside that very VIP room, facing a woman in her 30s. Even in the hospital, she was heavily made up, as though preparing for another social event. Hey, you, stop shouting, the girl ordered with authority. You must help me escape from here. Me, Brittany exclaimed. Why do you think I owe you anything? What did you say? The girl became audacious. I said you must, which means you must. Brittany understood that arguing with this crazed girl was futile, especially since she still had a tight grip on her hand. I need to get out of here to keep an eye on my fiancé, the girl explained. I'm sure he's cheating on me. How could he be cheating on you? You're pregnant. He's probably at home, worrying about you, Brittany suggested. Are you going to keep asking questions, or are you going to help me? The girl ignored Brittany's question. I'm going to try to leave the ward now, and you'll watch my back so I don't run into any doctors. Got it? Of course, clear, Brittany agreed. Just then, the voice of the head doctor of the department caught their attention. Where do you plan to escape to, Diane? He asked. You've been in the hospital for three days, but we haven't allowed any doctors near you yet. And if I may inquire, how should we explain your condition to Derek and Ben? What should we tell them about your health? That's your problem, Diane replied, lying on the bed as if nothing had happened. I'm asking you to discharge me tomorrow. I'd love to, but we've been ordered to conduct further tests, the doctor replied. Unfortunately, it's not feasible right now. To be honest, in all my years of practice, I've never had such a complicated patient. If you don't care about yourself, think about your child. And Brittany, go back to your room. You shouldn't be on your feet for too long. The doctor cast one more careful look at Diane, smiled, and left the room. Well, another failure, Diane muttered. When will they all leave me alone? You can't smoke. You can't have a cognac. So what can you do? But they are right. Brittany decided to argue with the girl. You're pregnant. It can harm your baby. Ha ha. Diane laughed and pulled a small bottle of cognac from her purse. She brought her finger to her lips, indicating that their conversation should remain confidential. Let me tell you a secret. I'm not pregnant at all. 
I just decided to deceive my fiancé. Really, what difference does it make if I'm pregnant now or if I get pregnant tomorrow? My Derek and I have been living together for so long that we could have been married ages ago. But he's always busy. You know who he is, right? He's a businessman. My father has high hopes for him. And, of course, so do I. Wait, so you're saying that your father and your fiancé think you're pregnant? They're worried about you, and you're lying to them. Brittany sought clarification. Yes. Diane continued her story with enthusiasm. Isn't it a brilliant idea I came up with? Well, you can't come up with anything better. Brittany whispered and wanted to leave the room. Wait, where are you going? Don't leave me alone here. I'm so bored. There's no one to talk to. Derek brought me to this hospital and rarely calls. He's probably having fun somewhere. Diane speculated angrily. How did it happen that he insisted on having you undergo tests? Brittany continued to ask her questions. Well, he caught me with a bottle of cognac and dragged me to the hospital. He claimed to be worried about the baby, wanted to make sure everything was all right with the little one. But what about me? We've been together for a year, and he still won't marry me. He should get married first. I'll only allow myself to be examined then. Diane explained and looked at Brittany with mockery. Are you married? It's hard to hide your pregnancy already. You have a big belly. Are you expecting a boy or a girl? Diane asked an unexpected question. I'm having a son. Brittany replied briefly, said goodbye to Diane, and rushed out of the room. During the night, she couldn't sleep at all. She pondered how different their fates were compared to Diane. Brittany had nothing. She didn't know how she would survive or raise her child. She worried that her son would grow up without a father and never know who he was. But she tried to console herself with the thought that she wasn't the only one raising her child without a husband. Many women raised their children on their own. As for Diane, she had everything except self-love. It seemed she was living the good life. She was going to give birth to her fiancé's child. No, she had to play games. Perhaps when you have everything. Life seems like a game with no real problems or worries. Brittany even found herself admiring Diane's fiancé, Derek. Who would have thought a man would care so much about his future child? He didn't listen to the foolish girl and had her admitted to the hospital for an examination. He did the right thing. But what would happen to Derek when he found out about Diane's lie? These thoughts haunted Brittany and prevented her from finding peace. She finally managed to fall asleep towards morning and got some rest. In the morning, it was a struggle for Brittany to get out of bed even a sleepless night had taken its toll. During the nurse's rounds, they noticed that her blood pressure had risen, and they called the doctor. Brittany was prohibited from leaving her bed in the room so she couldn't visit Diane. As the evening approached, Brittany's condition had stabilized. She walked over to the window to see what was happening in the hospital's courtyard. The ward's windows faced the hospital's parking lot. From the second floor, Brittany had a clear view of who was coming and going. Unexpectedly, she noticed a familiar female silhouette. It was indeed Diane. So, the restless girl had managed to get herself released. Walking beside her was a tall man who also seemed familiar to Brittany. After closer inspection, Brittany realized that the man walking with Diane was none other than Derek. Brittany felt a sudden pang of hurt and disappointment. Her legs began to wobble, her head spun, and her heart raced wildly. Hey, Brittany, are you okay? Doctor, doctor, Brittany passed out. Kristen cried out when she saw pale Brittany struggling to stay on her feet. Brittany woke up on her bed. She had no idea how long she'd been unconscious, and she barely remembered what had caused her to faint. Well, you really gave us a scare, Kristen said, noticing that her roommate had regained consciousness. You were standing by the window, and suddenly you fainted. Don't do that again, okay? Brittany could only nod in agreement, to drain to speak. This was the first time she had seen Derek since their initial and only encounter in the countryside. He probably had forgotten all about the girl who had tried to earn some money in that country house. But Brittany hadn't forgotten. No matter how much she wished to forget, 
she knew she would carry the memory with her for the rest of her life. As if reminding her, the baby began to kick in her belly. Brittany had to spend Christmas and New Year in the hospital. It wasn't until the end of January that she was able to return to the university, continue working in the archive, take her exams, and prepare for the birth of her child. With each passing day, Brittany found herself growing to love her baby more and more, eagerly anticipating the little one's arrival. April that year turned out to be warm and sunny. Having completed all her exams externally, Brittany submitted an application for an academic leave. She had only a few days left before returning to her hometown. There were still a few things to sort out at the dean's office, and then she would be ready to go. Brittany's pregnancy hadn't been easy, but she tried not to miss a single class and was diligent at her job. In addition to all this, she received a bonus. Over the months of her pregnancy, she had managed to save some money, which should tide them over for a while. Brittany tried to call her grandmother every day. Rachel eagerly awaited her granddaughter's return home and had prepared a room for her and the baby. Her mother also played a part in this, as they purchased a crib and other necessary items for the newborn. The day didn't seem to portend anything unusual. In the morning, Brittany planned to visit the maternity clinic to collect the results of her tests. After having breakfast, she began to get ready. She wore a comfortable dress and draped a cardigan over her shoulders. Putting on her shoes had become challenging due to her large belly. It was hard to bend down. After struggling with her sandals, Brittany located her keys on a shelf and was about to leave her dorm room when she unexpectedly heard the phone ring. Hello, I'm listening, she answered the unknown number. Hello, Brittany, it's Aunt Elizabeth. Remember me, I'm your grandmother Rachel's friend. The woman said, struggling to get the words out. For some reason, upon hearing her voice, Brittany began to feel uneasy. A sense of foreboding, perhaps even fear. Yes, I remember you, of course. How can I help you? Is everything all right with Grandma? Brittany asked, sitting down in a chair. Unfortunately, your grandmother has passed away. You need to inform the relatives and call the police. That was all the girl could hear. Elizabeth continued talking on the other end, but all Brittany could feel was the pain. She tried to stand up but, unable to maintain her balance, fell to the floor and lost consciousness. She woke up in a hospital room. The first thing she noticed was her abdomen. She realized that she was no longer pregnant. A drip stood next to her bed. Brittany attempted to recall what had happened and thought about her grandmother. She didn't want to believe what Elizabeth had told her. She hoped the elderly woman had jumped to conclusions and that Rachel was, in fact, alive. What about my baby? I hope he's all right, Brittany asked herself and tried to get out of bed. What are you doing? You shouldn't get up yet. The voice of a young nurse made the girl lie down again. Where is my child? Tell me, how is he? Brittany asked and grabbed the nurse's hand. Don't worry, your son is fine. He was born a month earlier than expected so he's under the careful watch of the doctors, the nurse explained. Can you remember when you lost consciousness? Your neighbor found you at 10 in the morning. If it hadn't been for her, we might not have been able to save your baby at 10 in the morning. So, Laura returned at 10 and found me lying on the floor, Brittany realized. I fainted around 8 in the morning, which means I was on the floor for about two hours. Removing the intravenous strip, the nurse advised Brittany not to get out of bed and then left the room. Brittany realized she was in the intensive care unit. She was relieved to know that her baby was safe, but she was anxious to see him. However, she knew she had to be patient. About half an hour later, the doctor entered the room. Hello, Brittany. How are you feeling? He inquired. I'm a bit dizzy and my stomach hurts, Brittany replied. Can you tell me if my son is okay? Don't worry, your son is under the care of another doctor. He'll come by to see you shortly, the doctor reassured her. We had to perform a caser in section. There was no other option in your case. Soon, you'll be able to get out of bed, for now. Rest and follow my instructions. Your son needs a healthy mother. Do you agree with me? 
Brittany nodded in agreement and asked if she could call her mother at home to inform her about what had happened. The doctor promised to bring her a phone and left the room. Brittany was able to call her mother an hour later. It took Kate three attempts to pick up the phone. Sweetie, Brittany, finally. I've been trying to reach you for so long. You know, Grandma. Kate said and began to cry. I know, Mom. Elizabeth told me. So what exactly happened? Brittany tried to clarify the situation. It was a robbery. Someone broke into Grandma's house but didn't expect her to be home. The police investigated the scene and suggested that she was likely pushed. She fell and hit her head on the corner of the cupboard, which caused her death. Brittany, the funeral is tomorrow. Will you be able to make it? Kate asked and started crying again. No, Mom, I'm in the hospital, Brittany explained. Mom, you've become a grandmother today. You have a grandson. What? But it's too early. You said your due date was in early May, Kate exclaimed. Brittany told her mother everything that had happened. How they managed to save the baby. Kate understood that Brittany wouldn't be able to attend the funeral. She tried to console her daughter, gather her strength, and focus on her son. Brittany followed her mother's advice. The next day, the doctors allowed her to get up. She walked around her room, constantly thinking about Rachel. After lunch, they allowed her to see her son. The baby was in a special room for premature infants. She could only observe him from a distance behind the glass door, but even that brought joy to Brittany. Her little son seemed to infuse her with newfound strength and self-belief. Watching little Paul, Brittany became convinced that she had someone to live for, someone to fight for happiness. In the evening, Brittany called her mother. Kate informed her that they had buried Rachel. Brittany learned that Kevin had gotten so drunk at the memorial service that he couldn't remember anything. How could her brother behave this way? Brittany couldn't comprehend it. She imagined how hard it must have been for her mother. She probably received no support from her father, as Doug was incapable of such a thing. Brittany had to stay in the maternity ward for two weeks. Her son quickly improved, so she hoped that she would be able to hold him soon. On the day of her discharge, nobody came to meet her. She left the maternity hospital alone, carrying her son. Watching the warm welcome other girls received from their families, Brittany stood quietly on the sidelines, feeling envious. Her grandmother's house felt eerily empty and silent. It was as if Rachel had stepped out to the garden or gone to a friend's house and would be back soon. Gently placing her son on the couch, Brittany walked into the kitchen. Her mother had prepared the house for her arrival. Everything was neatly arranged, and even the curtains and tablecloth were carefully ironed. And here you are back. Her mother's voice made Brittany startle. Yes, Mom, Paul and I are here. We won't be a bother, Brittany said and hugged her mother. I can't stay here with you, you understand. Your father won't leave me in peace. I'll go to work tomorrow, and in the evening, I'll come back to you, Kate said. I don't even know how you'll manage alone in this house. Everything will be fine, Mom. I won't have to live on the streets. Grandma had a sense that this house should be left to me. She had all the paperwork notarized. I'm grateful to her for that, Brittany sighed. Paul will grow a bit, become stronger, and then I'll think about my studies again. And don't come to me every day. Don't provoke Dad. Just be careful here. Don't forget to lock the doors. And don't forget to call, Kate requested. After preparing dinner for her daughter, Kate hurried back home. Brittany was left alone with her son. Paul was sleeping, and Brittany watched him while shedding tears. Just a year ago, she couldn't have imagined something like this happening to her. Just one wrong step, and her life had completely changed. Now she was a mother with a son, a beloved little bundle for which she was responsible. Brittany sat in the dimly lit room, not turning on the lights. She imagined how wonderful it would be if Rachel were there with her. But the house was quiet. Only the old wall clock loudly ticked away, counting the time. Two weeks passed. Kate visited her daughter almost every day, bringing groceries and helping Brittany with her baby whenever she could. Little Paul seemed to understand that his mother was alone, and there was no one else to help her. 
He behaved well, hardly ever threw tantrums, and slept a lot. One day, after feeding and putting Paul to sleep in his stroller, Brittany decided to do some laundry. While she was hanging the clothes, she didn't notice a man entering the backyard. He silently approached the baby and watched him. Brittany, with her back turned, didn't immediately recognize her brother. Kevin, it's been so long since I've seen you, she exclaimed and walked over to him. And you haven't changed at all, Kevin said, looking at his sister. It's like you never gave birth. Tell me, how did you manage to have such a miracle? And do you remember whose fault all this happened? Brittany hinted at her brother where you sent me last summer to save yourself. Are you trying to say that I'm to blame for you getting pregnant and having this? Kevin asked. Who is this? This, by the way, is your nephew. This is a little human being. Brittany replied sharply. So, why did you come here? I just thought of paying you a visit, Kevin mumbled, a bit embarrassed. Brittany, I wanted to ask you. Ask away, but make it quick. I have a lot to do. Brittany said, giving her brother a stern look. I wanted to inquire about the inheritance. Grandma's house belongs to all of us. When are you going to share our part with us? So, you came to find out when I'll move out of Grandma's house, so you can sell it. Well, know this, this house is mine. And it's not for sale, Brittany explained to her brother. What do you mean? It's only yours, that can't be. Kevin began to raise his voice. Grandma couldn't have treated me this way. You're lying. I'll show you the documents now, Brittany said, handing all the papers over for him to review. So that's how it is, Kevin shouted, giving back the documents. And here I thought. He suddenly fell silent, turned away, and walked towards the gate. I'll challenge this crazy old lady's decision in court. She couldn't have treated all of us this way. He yelled as he left the house. After the conversation with her brother, Brittany felt more disgusted than ever. She couldn't believe her own brother's behavior. Knowing that his sister had nowhere to go with a little child, he just showed up, demanding the sale of their only house. Such behavior was beyond comprehension for Brittany. A few more weeks passed. One day, returning home after another walk, Brittany noticed that the front door was wide open. Someone had broken the lock and entered the house. Frightened that there might be someone inside, she pushed the stroller outside and called her mother. Despite it being a work day, Kate managed to get off from work and hurried to her daughter's house. After inspecting the house, Kate realized that there was nobody inside. However, there was no doubt that someone had been in the house while the owners were away. The worst part became evident a little later, when Brittany opened the closet where she kept all her hard-earned money and found not a single cent. Everything she had managed to save had been mercilessly stolen. Kate felt terrible about everything that had happened, and it was a struggle for Brittany to calm her mother down. She had to file a report with the police. The officers performed all necessary procedures and promised to do everything possible to find the thief. Now. Brittany faced yet another problem, a lack of money. The assistance she received for her son was minimal and didn't cover all their needs. After a sleepless night, Brittany realized she had no choice but to find part-time work. The challenge was finding the time for a job and figuring out what kind of work she could do. Of course, her mother could help her, but her income was so meager that Brittany felt uncomfortable taking the little her mother had. She also knew that most of the money her mother did have was spent on medication. Her mother's heart condition was a constant source of concern, but the family couldn't afford a full medical examination. The next day, Brittany called her old friend and classmate, Anna. She wanted to know how Anna was coping with her baby. While sharing their recent news with each other, the two friends began discussing their problems. Anna, like Brittany, didn't have extra money so she planned to find a part-time job at one of the city's restaurants over the summer. I can't take on a full-time job for the whole summer. Unfortunately, Brittany sighed. I can't leave Paul with anyone. My mom only has a break during the winter, and my brother and father have no interest in my situation. Yes, your situation is tough, Anna sympathized with her friend. 
but you can earn money by working at big events. I'll keep you updated. As soon as an opportunity for part-time work arises, I'll give you a call. The two friends agreed and planned to check in with each other soon. Brittany was grateful for Anna's offer and eagerly awaited her call. She had to wait for about two weeks. Brittany was beginning to worry that their idea wouldn't work and that restaurants wouldn't hire for occasional shifts. Anna finally called late one evening when Paul was already asleep. Brittany, as usual, was tossing and turning in bed, trying to fall asleep. Anna, I'm so glad you called, she exclaimed when she saw her friend's number on the screen. Great. Tomorrow is Saturday. Can your mom look after Paul? You need to be at the restaurant by 4 o'clock. There's a grand wedding planned, and they are short on wait staff. Anne explained. My mom finishes work at 2 o'clock tomorrow, and she has her day off on Sunday, Brittany said. I think I can make it tomorrow. Please send me the address and a message. Everything worked out as planned by the friends. Kate rushed to her daughter's house immediately after her shift. However, Doug was quite upset that his wife wasn't coming home for the night and was going to look after their grandchild. But she paid him no attention. Right at 4 o'clock the next day, Brittany arrived at the designated location. Anna greeted her at the entrance of the restaurant and explained that there was a high-profile wedding scheduled in the hall at 7 o'clock. Their job was to serve food and drinks to the tables, promptly clear empty plates, and ensure cleanliness and order. After changing into their special uniforms, Brittany braided her hair and entered the banquet hall. She had never seen such a beautiful wedding setup before. It was clear right away that the event was organized for millionaires who didn't spare expenses. To be honest, Brittany was quite nervous, afraid she might make a mistake, but she did her best not to show it. Some of the dishes they were setting on the tables were entirely new to her. After skillfully handling the service, the waitresses were allowed to take a break. Brittany and Anna went to the restaurant's backyard, where unfamiliar men were barbecuing. They couldn't see the girls and were speaking quite loudly. These millionaires are completely crazy. They've thrown such a banquet. I could buy a nice apartment in the city center with that money, one of the men said. Living lavishly isn't off limits, sighed another. I heard who the groom is the owner of a chain of restaurants and hotels, and the bride's father is the owner of a major construction company. So, you could say today's wedding will go down in history as the merger of two great empires. Do you think the young couple isn't getting married for love, just for mutual benefit? The first man inquired. I don't know, but I saw the bride arrive at the restaurant, studying the menu. She caused such a scene. It made me sick to listen to it. In my opinion, it's better not to marry at all than to live with someone like that. A witch, that's what she is, shared his thoughts the second manual. Anna and Brittany listened curiously to the men talking about the hosts of tonight's event and silently looked at each other. Both of them were eager to see the newlyweds. They didn't have to wait long. Precisely at 7 o'clock, cars began to arrive at the restaurant. An elegantly dressed men and women stepped out. The hall gradually filled with guests. The most prominent among them was an elderly man in an elegant suit. The newlyweds arrived later than the others. Brittany was in the kitchen, and she was asked to bring a bottle of champagne. When she entered the hall, the groom and bride were already seated at the table, receiving congratulations from the guests. Brittany, unsuspecting, placed the bottle on the bar counter, turned around and out of the corner of her eye saw the groom. For some reason, she felt like she had met him somewhere before. Taking a closer look, she hid under the table. It was Derek, the father of her child. Brittany, are you out of your mind? And began to scold her, quickly, come out. They'll notice you, and you'll be thrown out of here. I can't, Anna, I can't. Brittany kept repeating the same phrase. What do you mean, I can't? Anna continued to demand. What's going on here? What kind of circus are you causing? The voice of the hall administrator made both girls jump. Brittany had no choice but to crawl out from under the table and apologize. She knew she looked foolish but couldn't explain her behavior. I'm sorry, I dropped a button. 
I thought it rolled under the table, she said, the first excuse that came to her mind. Stop this. One more stomp like this, and you'll be out of here without a penny, the woman hissed, making it clear that she wasn't joking. Start working now. The bartender has already poured champagne into glasses. Your job is to distribute them to the guests. Move on, and no more circus performances here. Brittany understood that she had no other choice but to go back into the hole and perform her duties. She wasn't surprised to see her old acquaintance Diane next to Derek. She hoped that neither Derek nor his bride would recognize her. It seemed like they were so engrossed in each other and the gifts that they didn't even consider paying attention to the wait staff. But Brittany was wrong in her assumptions. After a few minutes, she noticed the groom's curious gaze on her. He kept glancing at Brittany as if he wanted to ask her something. She tried her best not to look at Derek, pretending not to notice his stares. About an hour into the banquet, Diane, already a bit tepsy, was thoroughly enjoying herself. Brittany watched everything unfold, and for the first time, she caught herself looking at Derek not with hatred but with a hint of sympathy. She couldn't take her eyes off the young, fit, elegantly dressed man. If I had met him earlier, in a different setting, I might have fallen in love. Brittany thought to herself and immediately scolded herself for such thoughts. This man ruined your entire life. How many others like you has he done this to? Stop looking at him right now and just do your job. Who are you and who is he? To Brittany, it felt like she had turned into a robot following a pre-written program. Most of all, she wanted this to be over quickly to get her earnings and return home to her son. At around one o'clock, when the guests had consumed a fair amount of alcohol and were relaxed, the waitresses finally had the chance to take a short break. Brittany stepped outside, sat on a bench, and looked at the sky. Unexpectedly, she remembered her grandmother and began to cry. What are you doing here? I've been wondering about this all evening. A familiar voice, Derek's voice, made the girl jump. It was dark all around, with no lights on in this corner of the yard. Brittany couldn't fathom how Derek had found her here. I work here as a waitress, she replied as calmly as possible. What are you doing here? Aren't you afraid your bride will notice you're gone and start looking for you? Answer my question without asking questions. I'm waiting for your response. What are you doing here? Derek insisted. Did you approach me to blackmail me and demand money? What money? What are you talking about? Brittany retorted. I came to work in this restaurant. I couldn't have anticipated seeing you here. Sure, keep lying, Derek said skeptically. I won't believe in such coincidences for a second. Believe it or not, it's your business, Brittany replied, standing up from the bench to return to the restaurant. Wait, so you don't need money if you decided to work here on the side. You know, I can offer you a more profitable job. I'll pay well and rent you an apartment. You're a beautiful girl. I like you. What's your name? I can't seem to remember, Derek offered, grabbing Brittany's hand. Upon hearing such an offer, Brittany felt unwell. She couldn't remember what she said in response to the man. She pulled her hand out of his tight grip, rushed towards the street, and hopped into a taxi. Without changing out of her uniform, she went back home. Derek watched her silently, unable to comprehend what he had said to provoke such a reaction from the young woman. Since Brittany had fled from the wedding, several days had passed. Finally, Anna brought her the clothing that had been left at the restaurant. Unfortunately, Brittany hadn't been able to earn any money from her foolish stunt. She certainly wasn't paid for that mishap. Brittany had to confess everything to her friend. Otherwise, she would never understand the true reason behind what had happened. So, Paul's father is that millionaire, the groom from the wedding. And I wonder, he has so much money, Brittany. Tell him about your son. He should know and help you. I thought he seemed like a decent person. A decent person? I hate him. No, we'll manage to live with Paul without him. He shouldn't know about our son. I'm afraid Derek will take him away from me if he finds out. Brittany shared her concerns. For some reason, I feel like you're wrong, Anna tried to convince her friend. 
you won at the restaurant for the entire wedding. To be honest, Derek had a tough time with his bride. If only you saw how she got drunk and yelled at him by the end of the evening. I don't think there's any love between them. Why did he marry her? Yes, I'm familiar with his wife, Brittany admitted. She told her friend about her encounter with Diane in the hospital, how she behaved there, and how she deceived Derek about being pregnant. It seems that her pregnancy lie was exposed, but he still married her despite that. Well, everyone got what they wanted. I have my son, and he has an alcoholic wife, Brittany concluded. The next day, the weather took a turn for the worse. A cold wind and rain set in. After lunch, Brittany decided to take a walk. Paul began to get fussy and wouldn't fall asleep. Dressing her child warmly, she put him in a stroller and decided to walk to the nearest store. Not far from her home, she noticed a car with a drenched and shivering man attempting to fix it. Miss, could you help me, please? He asked Brittany. I need some water. Could you fill this container for me? Brittany, being a kind and compassionate person, didn't hesitate to help the man. She took the container, rolled the stroller with her baby back to the house, filled the container with water, and returned to the man. Here, take it. She handed the container to her random acquaintance. Have you been waiting here for long? Maybe you should flag someone down and ask for help to tow your car to a service station. I'd like to, but there aren't any volunteers, the man replied. My name is Joel. And yours, Brittany, she replied. You're waiting for help here, and my son and I are going to take a walk to the store. If you don't find any assistance, I'll treat you to some hot tea when we return. I can see you're really cold, she offered. With great pleasure, Joel agreed and got back under the car's hood. When Brittany returned, Joel was still tinkering with the car. So, any progress? She asked. As you can see, the man sighed and shrugged. I promise to treat you to tea. Come inside, warm up, and make the call to the auto shop, Brittany said, heading towards her house. The man locked the car and followed the girl. Paul continued to sleep peacefully in the stroller, so Brittany was able to put a kettle on the stove and set the table. You can wash your hands here, she said. Please have a seat. The kettle is boiling. The man did as Brittany had suggested. He enjoyed a cup of the aromatic beverage and smiled. You're a kind-hearted girl, Brittany. Not many people would invite a near stranger over for tea. What if I were a thief? He chuckled. No, I could tell right away that you're a good person. Brittany smiled back. I could see in your eyes that there's nothing to be afraid of. May I ask you a personal question? Joel inquired. Go ahead. I still have some time until Paul wakes up. Brittany replied and looked at her sleeping son. Brittany, do you live here alone with your son? Joel asked and immediately blushed at his question. Yes, Brittany answered. Does that surprise you? I'm raising my little boy on my own. It's tough, but I manage. I can't find a job. You understand, with a little child, it's hard to work. I think I'm the one you need, Joel unexpectedly announced. You see, there's a sports school nearby, owned by my good friend. He needs help with paperwork. I'll talk to him. Maybe he'll agree to hire you. But how can I work there with Paul? Where will I leave him? Brittany rejoiced and was surprised at the same time. You can take all the necessary documentation home and work with the papers whenever it's convenient for you, Joel explained. Leave me your phone number. I'll call you very soon. Joel charged his phone, called the auto repair service, and soon left Brittany's home. The young woman was surprised by the unexpected guest offer. Honestly, she had been dreaming of such a job for a long time, something she could do during her free time while her son slept. Three days later, Joel kept his promise. Brittany went to the sports school at the provided address and got the job. They promised to pay her on a weekly basis once she completed the task. Brittany had no time to think about Derek. She was living day by day, hoping that tomorrow would be better. So, what did you manage to find out? Derek asked, once again visiting his longtime friend, Gerald. Once upon a time, 
these men had attended the same university, played football on the field, taken exams, and become true friends. After earning his diploma, Derek went into business, while Gerald opened his detective agency. Since childhood, Gerald had dreamed of becoming a real detective and solving crimes. Surprisingly, with each passing year, his client base grew larger. It was Derek who had turned to him after his encounter with Brittany at his own wedding. I found out more than I expected, the detective replied, shaking his friend's hand. Tell me, Derek, why are you so interested in this girl? She's quite attractive, I must admit, but she doesn't seem to be from your usual circle, does she? First, tell me what you've learned. Derek repeated his request. All right, I can see you're impatient. Your Brittany lives with her little son in her grandmother's old house. Just as you wanted, I helped her get a job. She's, of course, a kind and naive girl, but at the same time, she's very smart. It's as if she can see through people. With a son, whose son? Derek was surprised and even began to stutter with anxiety. A little one, maybe about two months old. He was sleeping while I talked to her, Gerald replied not understanding Derek's reaction. Strange. So, she had a child. I wonder who the father is. Derek asked himself questions as though speaking to himself. Listen, Gerald, you need to go back there one more time and find out why she's living alone. Ask about the child's father. Question everyone you can find. And stay in touch with me. It took the detective several more days to learn more about Brittany than she knew about herself. Reviews about her were varied. Some thought of her as a bad girl who had given birth to a child of unknown parentage. However, most spoke of her as an honest, kind, and hard-working girl. He managed to find out a lot about Brittany's family and even met Kevin's friends. The detective had to visit the police station to reopen Rachel's murder case. After gathering all this information, he invited his friend to a restaurant to discuss the details of the investigation. Derek, what connects you to Michael? I figured out that your encounter with Brittany is linked to him, Gerald asked. Well, there's a story. A year ago, Michael and I started a joint venture. He began building another car wash, and I opened a roadside hotel and cafe. It's our joint project, and it's been quite successful. I stayed at his country house where I met Brittany. I thought she was just a frivolous girl trying to make money with her friends by entertaining men. But as I see it, I was wrong about her, Derek confessed. You won't believe it. But to find out everything, I had to spend the whole evening in the company of that unpleasant man and even ply him with drinks. He told me the whole truth about how Brittany ended up in his house. The girl has an older brother, Kevin, a rather dark character who enjoys gambling and has an unbelievable amount of debt. Michael decided to take advantage of this and promised to forgive his debt in exchange for Brittany. She became a victim of his cunning plan. Michael asked to bring his sister over for the evening as a gift to you, the detective explained. A gift. So that's why he was so eager to have me sign those papers. He even found a victim for it. I couldn't have imagined he was capable of this, Derek said, astonished. I need to go see Brittany right away and get to the bottom of all this. What for? To ask her if the child is yours, Gerald inquired. I'm more than certain that he is yours. Just look at that girl. Look into her eyes. She couldn't lie or deceive anyone. She's pure and trusting. She's raising the child on her own because she's proud and knows how you feel about her. Besides, she saw you get married. Why did you even do that? The news that Brittany had given birth and was living alone with her son shook Derek to the core. Immediately after speaking with Gerald, he got into his SUV and headed to her house. The day had been incredibly challenging. Brittany had spent the entire night with paperwork trying to complete all her tasks by morning. She was in desperate need of money. Paul needed clothes and medicine. Fortunately, the boy slept well at night, but during the day, Brittany couldn't leave his side for a moment. Exhausted by the day, she could barely stay on her feet. Paul was restless and kept kicking his legs, 
Brittany had just turned off the lights when there was a knock at the door. Who could it be? She thought. My mom would have called. Maybe Kevin can't stay out of trouble again and came to ask for money. Struggling to get out of bed, Brittany approached the door. Who's there? It's late, and we're not expecting anyone, she said and started to head back to her bedroom. Brittany, open up. It's me, Derek. We need to talk, the man said softly and knocked persistently once more. Derek, but what are you doing here so late? Brittany asked. I came to talk to you. Please open the door. I won't harm you, the man reiterated his request. Brittany didn't respond. She assumed that Derek would realize she didn't want to see him and leave. Returning to her room, she lay down on her bed and fell into a deep sleep, sleeping through the night. Typically, Brittany woke up before her son, managing to get a lot done, prepare breakfast, and tend to household tasks before he awoke. But today, the little one woke his mother up by making noise in his crib. Brittany opened her eyes and checked the clock, which showed it was half past eight in the morning. Quickly getting up with her son, she decided to take him for a walk before having breakfast. Pushing the stroller towards the garden gazebo, Brittany didn't immediately notice they weren't alone in the yard. In the gazebo, Derek was sound asleep with his head on the table. Perhaps he was having a pleasant dream because there was a serene smile on his face. Startled, Brittany's sudden movement frightened her son, who she was holding. Paul began to cry, awakening the man. Brittany, I'm sorry. I fell asleep here. I didn't mean to disturb you, Derek mumbled, his gaze shifting between Brittany and Paul. Hello. You startled us. I didn't expect anyone to be in the gazebo, she replied, closely observing the man. Did you spend the whole night here? What are you doing here? Your wife must be worried sick about you by now. Wife? No. I mean, I came to see you too. Derek struggled with each word, his eyes still fixed on the little boy. Brittany, why didn't you tell me that you had a son? Tell me, is he my child? No, of course not. Why would you think he's yours? I'm not the type of girl who gives birth and usually doesn't know who the father is. Do you think that too? Brittany began questioning, looking directly into the eyes of her unexpected guest. No, I don't think that way. Believe me, I don't. I'm sorry, Brittany. I shouldn't have left you and not cared about your well-being. I acted like a pig. Derek apologized. Time has sorted everything out. You married the woman you love. As for me, I'm doing the best I can. I'm living well. I'm raising my son. It's tough, but it's temporary. My son will grow up. I'll go back to college, get an education. Brittany replied as she started to put the baby back in his stroller. Brittany, I know he's my son. He looks exactly like me. I want to help you. That's why I won't leave here without you, Derek insisted. Why are you so sure he's your son? And in any case, get out of here before I call the police, Brittany said, wanting to go back into the house. However, Derek firmly grasped her hand, making it clear he wouldn't let her leave. Please understand, I just want to help you. I won't let my son live in these conditions. If you won't think about yourself, think about our son. Get ready now. I won't leave here without you, Derek declared. Brittany realized that resisting was futile. She silently sat on a bench and began to cry. She didn't trust this man and was afraid of him, although she instinctively understood he wouldn't harm her. Meanwhile, Derek picked up the baby and started talking to him. Well, hello, little guy. If I had known you were mine, I would have come much sooner. I don't know if you can forgive me, but I'll do everything to make it right, Derek said to his son. And Paul listened attentively, as if understanding what was being said. After about an hour, Brittany gathered her essentials. Derek placed her and the baby in his car and drove them away. Brittany warned her mother that she was leaving and promised to call as soon as things became clear. Kate didn't grasp the details of what her daughter said, but she could tell from Brittany's tone that everything was fine. Derek brought Brittany to a new two-bedroom apartment. On the same day, he bought everything the baby needed, stopped the fridge with groceries, and promised to visit every day. 
Brittany didn't know what her future held or what Derek was thinking. But she decided to live in this apartment for the time being and observe Derek's actions. One day, a few weeks later, Kate visited Brittany. She was surprised to see the living conditions her daughter was in. Brittany, this Derek is no ordinary man if he can afford this place, she remarked. Tell me, is he Paul's father? Brittany confessed to her mother, explaining everything that had happened. She told her about Kevin, who had talked her into the situation that led to her pregnancy, and about Derek, who cared for their son and appeared to love her. Stay with Derek, my dear, Kate advised. If he cares and loves you, and if you're happy with him, don't push him away. But, Mom, he's married. I don't know if he'll ever get a divorce, Brittany replied. To be honest, I'm living here without knowing where I stand or when all of this will become clear. The most important thing is that things are going well for you right now. Time will tell, Kate said and clutched her heart. Upon seeing that her mother was unwell, Brittany immediately called an ambulance, which arrived within 20 minutes. After examining her, the doctor informed them that she needed to be hospitalized urgently. Brittany couldn't leave with her mother, but left the hospital's address. When Derek arrived, she told him everything. Derek promised to ensure that Kate received the best care. Brittany could only see her mother the next day. The attending physician explained that Kate needed surgery urgently. Derek stood by her and promised to cover all the necessary expenses. Brittany didn't say much and just thanked him for his help. The following day, Kate underwent surgery. After a few days, the doctors reported that she was recovering well and allowed visitors. Doug came to visit soon after. In the hospital corridor, he ran into Brittany and, for the first time, looked at her not with anger but with love and gratitude. Forgive me, my dear, Doug said with tears in his eyes. If it weren't for you, your mother wouldn't be with us anymore. I feel so guilty towards you and our grandson. Stop it, Dad. I haven't been mad at you for a long time, Brittany replied. Where's Kevin? Why hasn't he come to visit Mom? Kevin, Doug hesitated. You and Mom don't know yet. Yesterday, the police came to us. He's being accused of. It's hard to say. Accused of what, Dad? Brittany asked persistently, looking her father in the eyes. They're accusing him of robbing and killing Grandma. Doug finally managed to say, but don't tell your mom yet. You understand, she's still weak. This news could be fatal for her. How can he be involved in grandma's death? Brittany wondered and slowly sat on a nearby table. This can't be. That's how it is, my daughter, Doug sighed. Your brother was deep in gambling debts. They threatened him and demanded their money back. So, he broke into grandma's house. She must have discovered him and started reprimanding him and without much thought, he pushed her. But Kevin didn't anticipate the force of the push. Rachel hit her head hard on a corner of the cabinet and died. So, Grandma's death is also on Kevin's conscience. And do you know, Dad, he ruined my life too. But that's not important now. What's crucial is that he's turned from a person into a stranger. He didn't realize what he was doing, sacrificing his own family for his whims. I'm sure he also stole my hard-earned money from the cabinet. Brittany sighed. Forgive me. Forgive me, my dear. Doug kept repeating, sitting in the hospital corridor. Returning home, Brittany told Derek everything. Derek stayed with their son while Brittany visited her mother in the hospital. Strangely, Derek wasn't surprised by the story Brittany told him about her brother. I learned about this yesterday, to be honest. My friend and I have long suspected your brother of being involved in that crime. By the way, he promised to visit you tomorrow. We'll come to see you in the evening. So, expect some guests, Derek informed her. When Derek and a man named Gerald arrived the next day, Brittany put the kettle on, brewed aromatic tea, and baked a pie. To her surprise, she found Joel on her doorstep the same man who couldn't fix his car in front of her house and got soaked in the rain. You, Brittany asked as soon as she noticed the familiar man behind Derek. So, Derek sent you to me. Did you help with the job? If only I knew back then, 
That's why we decided to handle it this way. The detective interjected. You have to agree, Brittany, that you never have talked to me or gotten close if you knew that I was Derek's friend. Yes, you're right, Brittany agreed. So why are you standing in the doorway? Come into the kitchen. I've baked a pie and made tea. While Derek played with their son, Gerald told Brittany everything he had learned about Kevin during that time. Everything Doug had told her turned out to be true. Kevin had already confessed to everything. Time passed, and Kate was discharged after three weeks. She felt well. She accepted the news about her son as if she had suspected it for a long time. Of course, she cried and worried, but she felt more ashamed for raising such a person. Her comfort lay in her grandson, whom she visited several times a week. Once, she came not alone but with Doug, who stood somewhat awkwardly in the hallway, not sure how to approach his grandson, whom he had ignored for so long. Why are you standing at the door like a stranger, Dad? Brittany said, addressing him. Come in, say hello to your grandson. Look at how much he's grown. Doug didn't keep them waiting for long. He took his grandson in his arms and teared up. Kate and Brittany didn't try to console him. They let him talk to the child, since the whole truth about Kevin came out. Doug seemed like a different person. He stopped nagging Kate about trivial matters and reached out to his daughter and grandson. What about you and Derek? Are you planning to drag it out and continue living as if you're not related? Dove asked his daughter before leaving. It's not like that. We're just raising our son together. He loves Paul and comes to help us every day, Brittany replied. He's married, and that says it all. Is he planning to get a divorce? Doug persisted. Dad, I didn't ask him. He knows I won't live with a married man. We're only connected by our son, nothing more. Let's drop this topic, Brittany requested as she stood in the doorway of her apartment. After bidding farewell to her parents, Brittany went to put her little one to sleep. Paul was exhausted from the day and slept quickly. Hearing the doorbell, Brittany thought her parents had returned because they'd forgotten something. Without inquiring about the person behind the door, Brittany turned the key in the lock and nearly jumped back. An unfamiliar woman burst into the apartment. She was dressed in light-fitting trousers, a stylish blouse, had a scarf on her head, and wore dark glasses. At last, I found you, the stranger hissed, removing her glasses. Brittany realized that the woman before her was Derek's wife. Diane. It seemed the unexpected guest had also recognized Brittany, and this was a complete surprise to her. It's you. You're that pregnant girl from the hospital I sent to fetch cognac. The woman said in amazement. I never expected to see you here. So, my husband's running after you. If I knew, I wouldn't have worried. Do you understand what I mean? I understand. You want to say I'm a complete nobody, and you're a goddess. Brittany replied, looking at her guest. You're quick-witted, Diane Smart. And what did my husband see in you? By the way, does he know you have a child? Where did you stash him while you were hunting for other women's rich husbands? My child is none of your concern, Brittany replied. Tell me what you want here and leave. It's already late, late. Don't make me laugh. You're probably waiting for Derek, aren't you? And do you know we're married? and it's not right to steal other people's husbands. Diane threatened with her voice. She took a pistol from her handbag and pointed it at Brittany. What are you doing? Put the gun down immediately, Brittany demanded, hoping that Diane was joking. What am I doing? You figure it out. What happens to those who interfere in other people's families? Who, without a shred of conscience, takes away other women's husbands and thinks they're doing everything right? Diane spoke with a menacing tone while gazing at Brittany with crazed eyes. I'll kill you and solve all my problems. How much did Derek promise you for your services? Confess. Brittany understood that arguing with the deranged Diane was pointless. She sat on the couch, thinking only about convincing her to lower the gun and making her realize the enormity of her actions. But Diane had no intention of stopping. She stood in front of the girl and began to aim at her. Stop. Can you hear me? Immediately. Derek's voice made Diane start. 
but she managed to shoot Brittany before he could intervene. The girl felt a sharp pain and lost consciousness. The first thing Brittany saw when she regained consciousness was the white ceiling of a hospital room. Her mouth was parched, and she desperately needed a drink. She remembered her son and moaned. Her voice summoned both a nurse and a doctor. Doctor, she's awake. Brittany, can you hear us? The nurse asked, looking into the patient's eyes. Brittany nodded slowly and closed her eyes. Her head spun, and nausea crept up her throat. She felt worse than she ever had. You're incredibly lucky, the doctor said. The bullet grazed your shoulder. Of course, you lost a lot of blood, but that's minor compared to how this could have ended. Brittany listened and understood that she was alive. To be honest, when she heard the gunshot, she thought her life was over, that she'd never see her son, her mom, or Derek again. Yes, she thought about him too because she had fallen in love, but she was still hesitant to admit it to herself. She couldn't remember what had happened next. All she remembered was the sharp pain in her left shoulder and people screaming before she lost consciousness. The nurse set up and four drip, wished her a speedy recovery, and left the room. Brittany lay there, thinking about her son. Where was he now, and how was he doing? What had happened to Diane, and who had called an ambulance for her? She kept asking one question after another, finding no answers. Eventually, exhaustion overtook her, and she fell asleep. She didn't know how long she slept, but the room was filled with warm sunlight, reminding her that life went on. Hello, Brittany. May I come in? Her mother's familiar voice finally woke her up completely. They told me you can have visitors now. So I rushed over after getting the call from the nurse. The doctors and nurses here are so polite. Mom, Brittany spoke with difficulty. Where's my son? Where's Derek? Why isn't he with you? Don't worry, sweetheart. Paul is with your dad. We had to switch him to formula feeding. We don't know how much longer you'll be here, Kate explained. If it weren't for Derek, that crazy woman might have killed you. I wouldn't have survived that. Mom, where's Derek? Why isn't Paul with him? Brittany got nervous, realizing that something had happened to her beloved. Just calm down, dear. The worst is over. The thing is, after Diane shot you and then pointed the gun at Derek, she wounded him as well. Fortunately, the bullet missed vital organs. You were both brought to the hospital and operated on. Realizing what she'd done, Diane fled. Derek called the ambulance himself, Kate informed her daughter. He's in the neighboring room, but he's still very weak. In the next room. Are you absolutely sure he's fine? Brittany grew concerned, not fully believing her mother's words. Kate understood that her daughter wouldn't be easily reassured. So she went to the adjacent room where Derek was lying. Hello, may I come in? She asked cautiously peering into the neighboring hospital room. In response, all she heard was the nurse's voice assuring her that the patient was asleep and not in any danger. Promising her daughter to come to the hospital with Paul the next day, Kate left, and Brittany spent the rest of the day and night sleeping. Two weeks passed, and Brittany and Derek were on the road to recovery. Derek's wound turned out to be more severe than Brittany's. The day came when Brittany could leave her room and visit Derek. He was lying in bed with his eyes closed, but when he heard that someone had entered, he opened his eyes and smiled. Brittany, I'm so glad to see you, he said. I've missed you. How are you feeling? Much better now. But you're still in bed. Brittany sighed and reached out to touch his hand. It's nothing. Everything will heal soon, and I'll be back to normal, Derek reassured her. Just as Brittany and Derek were starting to talk, their mutual acquaintance Gerald walked into the room. He informed them that Diane was undergoing mandatory psychiatric treatment. After a thorough examination, the doctors had concluded that she had been using drugs for quite some time, and she was under the influence of narcotics on the day of the crime. By the way, did you know that your wife had a lover, someone she was seeing even before the wedding? Gerald asked. It turned out to be a fitness club employee whom Diane used to visit regularly. I don't understand why she insisted on the wedding in that case. Yes, she was pregnant. But by the time we got married, 
She had already had a miscarriage, and there was nothing between us. I knew she didn't love me, and I didn't love her either, but I didn't want to disappoint her father. He was so eager for his daughter to marry me. We've known each other for so long. I always felt like he treated me as his own son. How is he coping after Diane's arrest? Derek inquired. He's holding up. I think he struggled to come to terms with the news that his daughter committed such a crime, nearly taking two lives. By the way, Derek, I have more news for you. You've been talking about Diane's pregnancy and miscarriage, but it was challenging. But I managed to find out that she was never pregnant. Consequently, there was no miscarriage either. Diane just managed to pay the doctors for their silence. However, now these doctors deeply regret falling for her persuasion and accepting generous gifts, Gerald revealed. That's something. Does her father know about this too? Derek continued to be astonished. Yes, he's been informed, Gerald replied. I also knew that she wasn't pregnant. Brittany interjected into the conversation. I was admitted to the maternity ward with a threatened miscarriage at the exact time when Diane was setting her own conditions there. One day, she caught me in the hallway and demanded that I buy her brandy. The princess was getting bored in the hospital and didn't know how to entertain herself. I started to resist, explaining how it could affect the baby. That's when she admitted that there was no baby and that she had created this whole circus just because she wanted to marry her fiancé. Diane was so sure of her impunity that she spilled the whole truth to me, not fearing that anyone would find out about her fake pregnancy. I also found out by chance who her fiancé was. My hospital room windows faced the courtyard where they greeted the female patients. Derek listened quietly. His eyes filled with so much love and a plea for forgiveness that Brittany involuntarily averted her gaze. Derek, you have another visitor, the nurse announced, peering into the room. A man is asking to see you. He says it's essential. Well, if it's that important, let him in, Derek agreed. A 65-year-old man entered the room. He glanced at Derek, then at Brittany and Gerald. Brittany felt like she had seen him somewhere before. Derek, I need to talk to you, he said. Brittany and Gerald were about to leave the room, but the new visitor asked them to stay. Please stay. What I want to discuss with Derek concerns you as well, he explained. You are Brittany, the girl my daughter attacked. Only after these words did Brittany realize that Derek's visitor was Diane's father, whom she had seen at the restaurant during the wedding. She didn't resist and took a seat. Derek, I want to apologize on behalf of my daughter, he said. I don't think she's capable of doing it herself. I visited her in the hospital yesterday. She looks perfectly normal, but she's spouting nonsense for some reason. She's blaming you for all her misfortunes. Although I knew very well that she was running to her fitness trainer and cheating on you, I've repeatedly asked her to stop those meetings. But you know her character. I feel guilty towards both of you, Derek and Brittany, for not being able to raise my daughter. She was left in my care after the divorce, as her mother was no longer interested. My wife went to Italy and never came back. I showered Diane with gifts without realizing she needed attention and love, not cheap clothes and other nonsense. Why did you divorce your wife? Perhaps in that case, Diane would have grown up in a complete family and been happy with her parents, Brittany asked. Unlikely. I married without love. In all honesty, she didn't love me either. Diane got married according to her parents' script. To be honest, throughout my life, I only loved one woman who also loved me but somehow ran away without explaining the reasons. I tried to find her and searched for a long time, but I never found her. Then life went on. I tried to forget her and stop looking. Although, perhaps I should have found her. She was the only one who made me truly happy. I built a huge company during my life. I thought of leaving it all to my only daughter but now I understand that it's impossible. Diane isn't the kind of person who can handle all of that. I've been thinking about whom to include in my will, but I still haven't found the answer to my question. 
Gerald and Derek listened to him, and genuinely sympathized. Brittany didn't know why, but this man felt close and familiar to her. Ten days later, Derek was already able to get out of bed. By that time, Brittany had been discharged. She, along with Paul, had visited the man many times, which made him incredibly happy. Autumn had firmly established its presence, but the weather outside was still unseasonably warm. Brittany eagerly awaited the day Derek would be discharged, though she hadn't spoken about it aloud. Finally, the long-awaited day arrived. Brittany put on her finest dress and wore her grandmother's pendant, which she had kept in her jewelry box with great care. She was now certain that her grandmother was her guardian angel and was helping her. She wasn't the only one there to welcome Derek on the day of his discharge. At the hospital's entrance, she met Diane's father. I thought it might be challenging for you with two men. Paul is young and Derek is still weak, so my assistance will come in handy, he said. Smiling at the girl, the man picked up Paul and the three of them headed towards the ward where Derek was. Derek was pleased to see Brittany and their son. He didn't expect to find his former father-in-law with them, but he was pleasantly surprised by his presence. The divorce process was in full swing. In a couple of weeks, Derek hoped to be free from the bonds of marriage and start a new life with the woman he loved. Derek, you're not completely well yet. But I believe Brittany will help you recover quickly, said the former father-in-law, handing the child to the father. I don't know how and where you two met, but I think you're incredibly lucky, Derek. Brittany is a wonderful woman and will make a great wife for you. Brittany and Derek didn't respond to his comments. They hadn't said anything to each other yet. They both realized that Ben was getting ahead of the events but he had no doubts about his words and continued to behave as if the young couple had already made all their decisions and were ready to join their lives. Don't be shy. I can see clearly that you love each other. Don't delay your decision. Look at your wonderful son here. He shouldn't grow up without a father. Do you agree with me, Brittany? He asked her, looking at her pendant and clutching his heart. Ben, what's wrong with you? Are you okay? Get a doctor. Brittany cried out, seeing that something was amiss with him. Doctors quickly provided the necessary assistance, and soon the elderly man regained consciousness. Brittany, where did you get that pendant? Ben asked when he was finally able to calm down a bit. Pendant. Don't worry so much, Ben. Brittany tried to reassure him. My grandmother gave me this pendant. She told me she had treasured it because it was a gift from a beloved person. What was your grandmother's name? Ben continued with his questions. My grandmother's name was Rachel. Brittany replied, realizing that she had misspoken. Ben covered his face with his hands and began to sob. He couldn't regain his composure for a long time. Derek, holding Paul, and Brittany couldn't comfort him. When he finally stopped crying, Brittany took the man's hand and continued her story. Unfortunately, my grandmother is no longer alive but she managed to tell me how she loved a young man, got pregnant by him, and then ran away. Apparently, this young man was from a wealthy family, and his parents had already found a bride for him. So she didn't want to ruin his life. She gave birth to a daughter, my mother. But when she returned, that young man was already married. She didn't remind him of her existence. She worked as a nurse at the hospital all her life. You should have reminded him. Maybe our lives would have turned out differently, Ben whispered, holding Brittany's hand. That young man was me. I gave Rachel this pendant. I had it made by a local jeweler based on my own design. There's no other pendant like it. It's unique. Oh, Rachel. It was only after your death that I found out I had another daughter and grandchildren. Brittany, it turns out you're my granddaughter. Grandpa, Brittany exclaimed joyfully. So, you're my grandpa. I immediately like you. I felt right away that you were a family. I want to visit the house where my Rachel lived all this time, Ben said and cried again. Oh, if only we could turn back time. Brittany didn't know how much time she had spent with her grandpa. When Ben finally calmed down, they left the hospital building and got into Ben's car, with Derek behind the wheel. Ben was in no condition to focus on the road. He held his granddaughter's hand all the way, 
as if afraid of losing her again. Brittany suggested that her grandpa stay in the apartment she shared with Derek, and Derek went home for the evening. The next day, Derek arrived early. Ben wanted to meet his daughter. Brittany had warned her mother that she was coming for a visit, but hadn't revealed with whom. When Doug and Kate saw that Brittany had arrived with two men, they were greatly surprised but kept their composure. Doug immediately took care of his grandson while Kate began setting extra places at the table. She was eager to find out who this elderly man was who had unexpectedly appeared in their home. When everything was ready, she invited the guests to sit at the table. Dad, I didn't come today for no reason. Ben is with us. She introduced him. Mom, I've always wanted to know what Grandma told you about your dad. About dad. Kate was surprised. She didn't say anything. She didn't like to bring up that topic. A couple of times, I tried to find out from her who my father was. But she brushed me off every time and didn't say a word. I understood that it wasn't worth pursuing that subject. So I stopped bothering her with those questions. Mom, I managed to find out who your father was. He's sitting in front of you. He only found out about your existence yesterday. Brittany informed her, looking at Ben and then at her mother. Dad, is it true, my dear? Kate was struck with happiness, walked over to her father and hugged him. Father and daughter couldn't stop talking for a long time. After lunch, Derek drove them all to Rachel's house. Ben remembered this place. It turned out that after the sudden disappearance of his beloved girlfriend, he had visited this house many times, but he was always met with a locked door. Even after getting married, he never gave up hope of meeting his love again. But time went by, and Rachel never returned. It was painful for Ben to visit the cemetery when Derek brought him there. It was clear that he didn't expect this kind of reunion. After so many years of separation, he could hardly believe that his own grandson, of whom he knew nothing, had caused the death of his beloved woman. Rachel, you're so clever for keeping my pendant. If it weren't for it, I would hardly have known that I have a daughter and a granddaughter. Thank you, my dear, for everything. The elderly man whispered, genuinely believing that Rachel could hear him. After meeting his daughter and granddaughter, Ben felt as if he had grown wings. Now he knew that his life had not been in vain, that he had a family, a daughter, a granddaughter, and a great-grandson. He didn't forget about his second daughter and constantly visited her in the hospital, where they were treating Diane for her drug addiction. Derek divorced her and proposed to Brittany. Wedding preparations were in full swing. Brittany, do you agree to be Derek's wife? The registrar asked. Yes, Brittany whispered softly. Derek, do you agree to take Brittany as your wife? The woman asked the groom. Yes, the man confidently answered and took the bride's hand. Snow was falling outside. Large snowflakes descended from the sky, swirling in their wedding dance. Brittany was also swirling in a dance, her stunning snow-white dress elegantly highlighting her waist and graceful shoulders. Derek couldn't take his eyes off his bride. All the hardships were behind them. Think about all the trials we had to go through before we realized we were made for each other. Brittany whispered to her husband when they were alone after the grand celebration. I always knew you were the one for me. I liked you from the very first moment I saw you. I laid eyes on you, and you immediately caught my attention, Derek confessed, drawing his wife closer to him. You know, they say everything happens for a reason. Perhaps that's true. If it weren't for Michael and your brother, we might never have met, and our Paul would never have been born. It's scary to think about what we'd be doing without those people. What about Michael? How is he doing? Brittany asked her husband an unexpected question. I've cut all ties with him. I don't want anything to do with that scoundrel, Derek replied. The signed contracts have been annulled. He couldn't understand for a long time why I did that. Well, I don't think he'll ever understand. People like him are beyond redemption. But why are we even talking about that man? Today, we have more important matters to attend to. Today is our first wedding night, and I dream of you, Brittany, giving birth to a beautiful daughter. 
Derek embraced his wife and held her close as if she were the dearest and most beloved woman in the world. Brittany rested her head on his shoulder and quietly wept, overwhelmed by such incredible and long-awaited happiness.